I'm going to resume the recording here. We're going to get started. Admit all. All right. Hello, everybody. We're just getting started. Uh, thanks for joining uh, the People's Hearing to protect Greater Chaco or defend Greater Chaco. Uh, we're going to give it a couple minutes here to let folks trickle in. Um, a lot of people wanting to participate today and uh, can't tell you how much we appreciate you joining us and showing up to speak out for the greater Chaco region. We're getting a lot of participants here. This is great. We're so excited. Um, bear with us here a little bit. This is a, kind of an experiment in progress too uh, in terms of uh, accommodating everybody and creating a, a, a safe and a productive public forum like this. Um, let's see. I'd also say in the meantime, we definitely encourage everyone to use the chat to introduce themselves or if you have any needs from us as facilitators, please use the chat. And uh, just uh, so folks know, my name is Jeremy Nichols. I'm the Climate Energy Program Director for Wild Earth Guardians, which is a member of the Chaco, uh, Chaco Coalition. And I have as a co-host today, Rebecca Sobel with Wild Earth Guardians. Yeah, and as Rebecca said, if anybody needs anything, we're gonna give it a couple minutes, let some folks trickle in before we get going. If anybody needs anything, uh, feel free to use the chat function. It's there for everybody to use. Um, also, feel free to unmute, and if you need to talk, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, but if you're not talking, please mute yourself so that uh, we can minimize the disruptions. Hello, we got some folks coming here. Wow, Paul from Pendleton, Oregon. So cool. <clears throat> We're getting folks trickling in here. This is great. Thank you so much to everybody for joining today. I'm going through the list. It's great to see everybody's faces. If, if you can do video, please do it. Um, we want to see people. We want this to feel as much like a public forum as possible, uh, which is kind of our response to the Bureau of Land Management. When they held, quote, public meetings uh, on their plans to expand fracking in Greater Chaco, they wouldn't allow anybody to be on video. And uh, we want to definitely want to do things differently today. So like I said, we're going to give it just a couple minutes. At 3.05, we're going to formally kick off this people's hearing to defend Greater Chaco. And uh, that way everybody can get settled in and we can get going. And um, if anybody has questions, wants to comment, please uh, use the chat function. If you need to speak up, feel free to unmute yourself. If you're uh, not speaking, uh, please mute yourself so that uh, we can minimize the disruptions. And uh, we'll get going here in just a couple minutes. Thanks, everybody. I see some, before we officially start, um, I see some friends that have already joined, Hazel specifically, but I also wanted to put the call out. Um, we had um, Council Delegate Daniel So, who's a Navajo Nation Council Delegate, was supposed to kick us off with a prayer today, but he is detained with uh, Navajo Nation Council duties. And our second runner-up, uh, Mario Atencio, unfortunately, is dealing with family emergencies related to COVID-19. And Samuel Sage is also dealing with emergency response efforts in the community. So we have found ourselves without somebody to open today's um, people's hearing with a prayer. 
And if anybody would like to, um, please say so in the chat and we'll make space. Or unmute yourself. Are there any elders on the call? Hi, this is Hazel. Hi. Hello there. Um, that, hey, thank you for including me on this call. I appreciate it. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and say a prayer, opening prayer, so we can get started with the program. And um, I was just having my lunch here. So on a Zoom calls, Zoom calls every day. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to just uh, pay some respect to our environment. Uh, the elements that be with this meeting to talk and be here with all of us all the folks that are have a good heart have a good heart and uh, have a good mind and good spirit and want to help the Dene people and the, the help all all traditional indigenous people that have their heart at the Chaco Canyon that have their mind and spirit to help Chaco Canyon the whole area the whole land the whole specificness of the reason why we want to keep this land sacred to Canyon Ashwater, please be with us through this meeting. Make our minds open up, make our heart open, make our spirit open to the holy ones that take care of the land for us, that are that we don't see them, but there are ancestors out there. Please be with them too, Tatian Jadian. And please bless us with rain, Tati, and have us some good healthy rain as we as we protect our sacred places. With this, I say in a, the best way I can to talk to you and be with everyone that's on this call and then folks that can't make it. And be with everyone and all the families that are hurting. Talk to you. Some of them were really, really bad off. Talk to you. Please be with them. I really pray for those people. Let us all drink water today and, and give thanks to water if we drink it. They can protect us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hazel. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Why don't we, uh, we're, we're going to get things going here. Thank you to everybody who is here today. My name is Jeremy Nichols. I'm the Climate and Energy Program Director for Wild Earth Guardians. And I have with me as a co-host Rebecca Sobel, uh, my senior climate energy campaigner for Wild Earth Guardians. Uh, we're members of the Frackoff Chaco Coalition, and Wild Earth Guardians is helping uh, the Frackoff Chaco Coalition with hosting this uh, people's hearing to defend Greater Chaco today. And uh, this hearing is all about creating a forum for people to be heard, to speak out for the Greater Chaco region, and for us to show the Trump administration and the Bureau of Land Management uh, what listening to the people really means. And we're here today to give people uh, the time, the space to speak out, to speak their mind. And this is all largely in response to uh, a plan that the Bureau of Land Management and Bureau of Indian Affairs has proposed to expand fracking in the greater Chaco region of Northwest New Mexico. And uh, in, in response to that plan, these agencies held virtual quote, public meetings over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and as some of us who participated in those saw, those meetings were uh, really a sham. And uh, they, didn't, they weren't anything close to what a public meeting, public forum should look like. And we decided, Rebecca and I and the Frackoff Chaco Coalition decided, you know what, we're gonna do our own hearing and we're gonna show uh, to the Bureau of Land Management uh, what the people see, what they want, what they're concerned with. Um, so before we get going, Rebecca, do you want to highlight the uh, group agreements for everybody? 
Sure. Um, there is going, we're going to be uh, having an account that is a share screen cycling through some slides. Um, and if anybody would like something posted on this screen, um, you can either note it in the chat or send us an email at info at fracoffchaco.org. But the first slide that we're putting up today are um, generally our group agreements for today's meeting. And these are also adapted agreements from, um, that we work with within our Greater Chaco Coalition. Um, they're adapted from the Hamas Principles of Democratic Organizing. Uh, and they are pretty simple. They include being inclusive, which for this meeting we mean um, being respectful to each other's voices. Everyone's welcome here. Uh, we're asking, everyone is allowed to speak at any point in time, but we are asking you to mute yourself when you're not talking. Um, we're also reminding everyone to let people speak for themselves that this, there are many voices missing today in today's forum. Unfortunately, the fact that this forum is being held online prevents access for many of the most impacted folks to join us. So this is our attempt to work together to create more equitable spaces to um, share voices and highlight those voices that have been missing. And we also continuously throughout today's hearing are gonna be reminding ourselves that this is not enough and that there are many people missing. Um, also today, just looking towards the future, we're working to build just relationships. Um, that's during today at the People's Hearing and also in, as we continue to do this work, fighting extraction in the future. So we encourage you all to connect with each other. You can private chat each other uh, through the chat box by picking somebody's name if you'd like to. You can also chat the full group or the list of panelists. Also today, we're going to be rotating MC duties. Um, some folks from the coalition have already signed up and volunteered to hold some space, but all are welcome to give comment today. Uh, we will be, just as a, a rule of thumb so everybody knows, uh, we will be going through order based on folks that have registered. Although we are um, asking any elected officials, local community folks, indigenous peoples and elders to identify yourself and we will jump you to the front of the queue. Um, we definitely appreciate everybody's patience as we learn this new um, forum and figure out uh, how best to facilitate. And that last group agreement sort of underlines all of those points is that we're all here together, working together in solidarity and mutuality. Um, this is this is about um, giving voice to the many that care about protecting and defending the greater Chaco landscape and the people that live within the landscape. Um, but we're also here fighting for environmental justice and equity on larger issues and we will continue this fight beyond today's people's hearing and we hope that we will be doing that together with all of you. Thanks so much for that, Rebecca. Um, do you want me to give our quick spiel and then we'll launch into giving people a chance to comment? Okay. Um, and again, you know, if people have questions or comments, please use the chat box, uh, use it liberally. That's what it's there for. If you need to speak out, feel free to unmute yourself. Otherwise, please keep your line muted. If you're joining by the phone and need to speak out, uh, star six will unmute your phone and, uh, and we'll hear you um, and we'll keep getting people in. So this is great. We have almost 50 people to, uh, so far. This is fabulous and over 100 people registered to speak out today. So we're super excited about this. But as Rebecca said, uh, this is a bit of an experiment too. So bear with us. We're all in this together. Uh, we, we're gonna do everything we can to make sure everybody is heard. So uh, with that said, um, the Bureau of Land Management and Bureau of Indian Affairs are threatening to frack more of the greater Chaco landscape. Navajo Nation and other tribal nations and communities are experiencing disproportionate impacts of coronavirus. The price of oil and gas has plummeted, and now the Trump administration is soliciting comment on a plan that would add between 2,000 to over 3,000 new industrialized fracking wells within communities across the greater Chaco landscape. Because of our relentless calls, the public comment deadline on the fracking plan was extended from May 28th to September 25th. The Bureau of Land Management and Bureau of Indian Affairs have held virtual meetings to solicit public comment, but too many of the most impacted people were unable to attend. Although many people are also not able to participate in today's people's hearing, we hope to create an unrestricted space to provide comments on the fracking plan and we'll submit this hearing to the Bureau of Land Management as part of the official record. And I should note, this is uh, being recorded and we're also live streaming on the Frack Off Chaco Facebook page. So uh, it'll be posted for later, folks can check it out. Um, 
We're also calling on our federal agencies to do better and fulfill the, their promises. The Bureau of Land Management and Bureau of Indian Affairs must solicit meaningful tribal consultation, which includes free, prior, and informed consent. At a minimum, the Bureau of Land Management and Bureau of Indian Affairs must hold public meetings in the same Navajo and Pueblo communities the agencies previously identified as impacted by this fracking plan. The Greater Chaco Coalition continues to demand a resource management plan that prioritizes public health and safety, air and water, and the protection of cultural resources and the sacred landscape over any more fracking. Even as oil and gas prices have fallen to historic lows, the administration continues to bail out the oil and gas industry. Today, we say Greater Chaco is not a sacrifice zone, and we call on the administration to put people first. The people's hearing follows principles of democratic organizing. If there are elected officials, local community, elder, or indigenous voices that would like to speak first, please send us a chat to jump the speaker queue. So with that, uh, we, uh, we have our list of speakers who have registered, but again, as Rebecca said, we invite elected officials um, uh, to, if, if you would wish to comment, uh, it, people it, from impacted communities. Um, Rebecca, are you managing the chat? I am manning the chat and I just um, managing the chat and I just wanted to give a, a note to everyone that what Jeremy just said we plan on reading that um, every half hour every hour just to remind us uh, in this space um, who's not here and what we are here to do. Um, I have not seen anybody in the chat that has identified as uh, not just an elected official but any impacted community members indigenous peoples or elders that want to speak first please say so. So let's just get started and we can um, continue to, to let folks in as they want. I'll also let everyone know that we did receive a fair amount of um, both written and video footage that folks would like to, to have included as part of this record. And so we will be playing that on the screen share um, intermittently every four or five commenters. And uh, unlike the Bureau of Land Management, we want people, to the extent you're comfortable, to be on video. We want to see people's faces. Uh, this is a true public forum, and so we want it to feel as close to that as possible. And we're not giving any time limits, but please, as you do speak, be respectful of other people who do want to comment. We're going to be here as long as it takes, um, but, uh, but just want to make sure people, people have a chance to say what they need to say. And uh, so, uh, so does everybody else. So with that, Rebecca, should I just start on the list? Okay, so first up here, um, Lawrence Walker. Is there a Lawrence Walker? And I think some people are gonna be popping in as, we, uh, as this unfolds. So uh, we'll just go back to Lawrence. Um, Sophia Jeffrey. Is there a Sophia Jeffrey? Okay, we'll come back to people, so no worries. Uh, Mayan Barudin, I hope I, I might have gotten that right with Vote Solar. Okay, we'll come back. Uh, Aurora Craig McBride. Okay, we'll come back. Uh, Patricio Dominguez. Greetings. Uh, okay, I guess you can hear me. I saw you smile when I said greetings, so that yes, means I'm gotcha. alive and in living color. Okay, I have a modest proposal, and it goes like this. As the Frack Off Group Coalition, we should file an injunction against the BLM, the Navajo tribe, and the BIA on these grounds. The grounds are that Chaco is a recognized religious site. It has the full protection of a church as a religious site. So therefore, it should be protected under the Freedom of Religion Act and the um, Religious Land Use Act, which uh, you, know, you can look up if you're not familiar with those. 
Now the injunction would state this, that the Navajo tribe has no standing to request a change of protected boundaries in that the Navajo tribe has never accepted Chaco Canyon as one of its religious sites. It has never been there to worship, pray, or otherwise accepted it. It has no descendancy to Chaco Canyon, that the only groups that have standing in a question about boundaries that may touch upon the religious nature of Chaco Canyon are the people that have descendancy. That is the Pueblo people, that any, any conversation, any negotiation with people other than those that have descendancy is a violation of the Freedom of Religion Act. So the injunction would be filed on the grounds that the people that the, that the BIA, the, B, uh, the BLM have no, no, have been negotiating with a group, the Navajo tribe that has no standing on this question. I believe this injunction would hold the would, would hold back the process long enough to fully establish whatever other uh, legal motions need to go forward in order to stop this process. But I honestly believe that that is the tact to go forward rather than to follow a political tact, rather than to follow a um, economic tact or any one of the other tacts that the only one that really will have any standing will be the religious uh, the religious tact. And because it is the only one of these that is actually guaranteed by the Constitution. All others can be uh, moved by uh, the uh, pre presidential uh, discretion, uh, act of Congress, and all these other things. But the, the religious the religious question is is protected by the Constitution and the subsequent acts that have been used to refer back to the Constitution as protection. So that is my modest proposal. I don't really think it would be that difficult to file this injunction. Thanks so much for the comments, Patricio, and thank you everybody for your comments. So we're just gonna keep it going. Uh, next up, I have uh, Mike Eisenfeld. Is Mike on? Okay, we'll come back to Mike. No, Mike is there. Mike, you're muted. I'm, I'm sorry about that. No worries. Uh, Great. Hey, thanks for the opportunity to be on this call. And um, I think that, you know, one of the most important things about um, public involvement is having the opportunity to hear from other people and to have a sense of, um, you know, what's been going on all these years. And I live in Farmington. I work for the San Juan Citizens Alliance and I live with my family up here. And I think that um, we've been working on some of these issues since about 2007, 2008 when uh, they wanted to develop the road, uh, County Road 7950 and pave it. And we thought it was associated with uh, energy development. And then um, kind of the proliferation of oil and gas leases um, and all the problems associated with kind of business as usual of the Farmington Field Office is a, uh, streamline office of the Bureau of Land Management. Um, all they think they do is um, permit oil and gas development. And, and th they have a lot more responsibilities than that. So um, before kind of we had the opportunity to get um, the comment period extended, which I think um, was definitely necessary um, I had put some thoughts together about um, some of the comments that I had on this whole process and 
the resource management plan amendment, environmental impact statement. It's a very unwieldy document um, because it's had like a five year history um, and there's environmental consultants who are working on it. I think that it's very disjointed. Um, doesn't make a lot of sense, but I'm one of the poor saps that reads these things. Um, and I'm also like available if folks um, would like certain things pointed out because you, you don't really have to read the whole document. You can read essential parts. But anyway, um, what I wanted to say is basically that the consultation with consulting parties and cooperating agencies remains incomplete under the National Historic Preservation Act and the National Environmental Policy Act. Ethnographic studies and cultural resources analysis have not been conducted and documentation of consultation requirements stops in 2017 in the RMPA EIS in chapter four in the consultation and coordination section. The high development potential for oil and gas development 2018 to 2037, see figure 3 23, is centered in the Nagizi and Lybrook areas on the checkerboard of the Eastern Agency of the Navajo Nation. These areas have already suffered from the cumulative impacts of significantly disproportionate and adverse air quality, water quality, and public health and safety impacts. The BLM and BIA have a considerable responsibility to legally evaluate cumulative impacts and environmental justice as it relates to these communities. The range of alternatives in RMPA EIS would allow from 2,345 to 3,200 new oil and gas wells, including under the no action alternative. This is an inadequate range of alternatives. A real no action alternative with no new oil and gas wells should be analyzed. The RMPA ES goes a great length to justify the purpose of the need of the project is associated with favorable oil prices. The oil play in the southern part of the Farmington field office boundary has drawn considerable interest. This may have been the case in 2016 to 2018 when many sections of the RMPA EIS appear to have been written. Current oil and gas prices in northwestern New Mexico depict a dying oil and gas industry where the multiple use responsibilities of the BLM should now be the focus for management of public lands. Even industry experts like T. Greg Marion have recently been quoted as saying, we are knee deep in a bust with a glut of natural gas domestically and new oil and gas wells uneconomical to produce at these prices. And that was on the KSG interview on Scott Micklin show, April, 2020. The RMPA EIS is an amendment to the 2003 BLM Farmington RMP, highlights the general 20 year life span of an RMP. A new RMP for the BLM Farmington is warranted to look at all resource values that are part of BLM's multiple use mission. The RMPA EIS includes two supplemental reports, a 2020 affected environment and a 2020 environmental consequences report that appear to be added information to the dated circa 2016-2019 affected environment and environmental consequences in the RMPA EIS. The latest 2020 supplemental reports need to be the basis for the RMP EIS and replace the stale data from 2016 to 2019. And finally, the greater Chaco landscape is a critical region where industrialization of the landscape is incompatible with protection of cultural resources, heritage, and living communities. BLM and BIA have no justification to continue to marginalize the Chaplin landscape with oil and gas leasing, permitting, and development. And finally, kind of on a, on a personal note, um, I don't think that um, we should accept any more oil and gas drilling in um, Northwestern New Mexico. I think we've had um, enough. There's approximately 20,000 oil and gas wells that um, are scattered throughout um, our communities. And the Chaco area, um, the Greater Chaco Landscape, the World Heritage Site, um, you know, don't let this be just about, you know, Chaco Park. Um, this is also about Northwestern New Mexico and all the connectivity. And anyway, um, it's also, um, I just appreciate everybody 
who has sort of galvanized um, the discussion. And I would say that it's really important to keep the pressure on the Department of Interior, BLM, and BIA, particularly when it comes to the incomplete consultation. And also um, that um, we don't have to accept more oil and gas. We don't need it. Thanks so much for that comment, Mike. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks to everybody who's, uh, who might have joined in the meantime. So we're just going through the list of people who registered and uh, trying to do it um, uh, in the order that folks registered. And uh, we'll keep going here. So next up, uh, Hazel James Toey. Hazel, you uh, ready to comment? <clears throat> yes. Great. Hello, everybody. Um, well, uh, the Navajos that live within the area of Chaco Canyon, um, they are, you know, directly affected by this oil and gas. And, and with the COVID-19, um, the people out there are really having a hard time. And the only thing that I can say, express on their behalf, um, is this, uh, it's just that, you know, I, I'd like for them to be heard one day again to, to try to get them on record. Um, and so I could probably help with that by, um, having another call with some of them as well as, uh, getting a, a, a questionnaire out there to them. But the only way that we can continue our communication efforts is is to um, to get on, on the radio. And that's how we get a lot of news out to the to the grassroots because a lot of them don't have electricity and and say so they the only thing they listen to is the radio. And there's not enough announcements on the radio uh, regarding Chaco. And so that's why they're not really responding as well. So that's just my take on this. And I really agree with uh, my brother, Mike. He did a great job explaining all the specifications that, that are very well um, uh, researched. And, and I, I, I trust his work. And I, I trust um, also Rebecca's work on, on all the stuff that she's been working on all these years. And um, if it was Robert, he would have had something more to say. <laughs> but I'm just here filling in. Thank you so much for allowing me to say a few words. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Hazel. Um, and thank you to everybody who's participating. So at, at the, every half an hour, we take a time just to give people a quick introduction. Um, and uh, for, especially for people who may have joined uh, after we started. So just gonna give a quick spiel again. Um, the Bureau of Land Management and Bureau of Indian Affairs are threatening to frack more of the greater Chaco landscape. Navajo Nation and other tribal nations and communities are experiencing disproportionate impacts of coronavirus. The price of oil and gas has plummeted. And now the Trump administration is soliciting comment on a plan that would add between 2,000 to over 3,000 new industrialized fracking wells within communities across the greater Chaco landscape. Because of our relentless calls, the public comment deadline on the fracking plan was extended from May 28th to September 25th. The Bureau of Land Management and Bureau of Indian Affairs have held virtual meetings to solicit public comment, but too many of the most impacted people were unable to attend. <clears throat> Although many people are also not able to participate in today's people's hearing, we hope to create an unrestricted space to provide comments on the fracking plan and will submit this hearing to the Bureau of Land Management as part of the official record. We're also calling on our federal agencies to do better and fulfill their promises. The Bureau of Land Management and Bureau of Indian Affairs must solicit meaningful tribal consultation, which includes free, prior, and informed consent. At a minimum, the agencies must hold public meetings in the same Navajo and Pueblo communities the agencies previously identified as impacted by this fracking plan. The Greater Chaco Coalition continues to demand a resource management plan that prioritizes public health and safety, air and water, and the protection of cultural resources and the sacred landscape over any more fracking. Even as, even as oil and gas prices have fallen to historic lows, the administration continues to bail out the oil and gas industry. Today, we say Greater Chaco is not a sacrifice zone. 
and we call on the administration to put people first. The People's Hearing follows principles of democratic organizing. If there are elected officials, local community, elder, or indigenous voices that would like to speak first, please send us a chat to jump the speaker queue. So we're just reading that periodically through the, uh, throughout the people's hearing today, just to, so that we're introducing people and making sure everybody's informed and uh, able to participate and understands where we're at. So um, uh, we will proceed to uh, provide people another more chances to comment. So um, it looks like uh, Renee Millard Chacon. I'm sorry. Are you on? I'm sorry. Uh, this is Hazel. This is Hazel again. Can I just say one more thing? I'm sorry. Yes. I no. didn't introduce myself. Yeah. Uh, I'm Hazel James Tohi, and I work with San Juan Collaborative for Health Equity, and um, uh, I I'm the coordinator of that organization. And just more recently, we got uh, grant funding to to do food deliveries out in the eastern Navajo and northern New Mexico. And so that keeps me very uh, busy and occupied as well. And then I, I'm also working with the Tri-Chapter Alliance and, um, and making sure that we stay, stick together to get the health impact assessment uh, going um, for the, for the Tri-Chapter area. So that's still going through the Navajo Nation IRB process. And because of COVID, we got off schedule. And we're really hoping that possibly back uh, sometime this year we'll get them all approved. Well, two of them, one of them's approved, and we just got two more to go. And um, one of them's with the UNM Tree Center in Albuquerque with Vincent Warito, and the other one is with uh, Dr. Herbert Benali and Dr. Should I go ahead? Hello, thank you. Thank you, Hazel, too, for all your work. And I'm grateful to all of you for all this very crucial work in, in unity towards this narrative and this intention in this way. I am, um, <clears throat> good afternoon. I'm Renee Millar Chacon. I am youth program manager from, or coordinator from Spirit of the Sun at Four Winds American Indian Council in Denver. I also flat fight on a bunch of social justice and climate justice issues. Today alone, I don't know if anybody is aware, but the Trump administration is holding a task force for MMIW, and it's called Operation Lady Justice. They're holding sessions right now to reach out to tribal leaders. However, they're doing and running into the same issues that we always have in, in Native and in Indigenous communities is the digital divide. So my issue as a coordinator, as a teacher, is always making sure that right now during this crucial pandemic, we still have the platforms accessed in the same equity as every other population. It's crucial for our narratives, it's crucial for to combat invisibility in the American identity. That being said, we know what predatory looks like, and I stand with you in Chaco Canyon knowing that this is predatory capitalism and nothing less, and predatory is designed to kill. I also understand the demand for protection and accountability over any further fracking or any, any other issues. Right now in Denver, we are fighting, three fighting on three separate bills. And the one thing that has helped most of all in our communities that are having this lack of access to communication is saturation of information, is knowing what local bills are going on, is being able to have that constant saturation of mutual aid because people are busy, people are on those scales of life and death, and we need to keep in mind that their support needs to be in constantly having that information to protect and arm themselves. Right now, Congress has the Bill of 116th Congress Bill, Section 27, support by National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences for research on health disparities impacting communities of color. I believe that this could be key in by, if it has to be by the Western narrative, by research alone, in understanding how these health disparities are killing and it's still a current form of genocide by predatory capitalism. We were the first victims and we're continuing to be those victims and here's all the information and polls to prove it. In Denver, I also work with Conservation Colorado in 
I'm doing uh, local legislatures on three different bills. For us, the bills are HB 2012-65, a bill to expand emissions monitoring and emergency notification for controlled emissions of hazardous air pollution. We also have SB 2204, a bill to create a new program to conduct air quality monitoring, research, and analysis, and set fees for tons of, for per ton of pollution emissions. And HB 201143, a bill to increase Colorado's maximum daily fine for air and quality violations to 47,000. The best protection is accountability, but accountability means nothing if there's enforcement. We already know that Trump is rolling back EPA emissions. We already know Andrew Wheeler already supports weakened emissions and wants to weaken them. We know that we're not going to be able to play their game unless we have the bureaucratic method behind it, unfortunately, still. So that does maintain having good camaraderie with research communities and knowing that we can still protect ourselves, at least with information and able to protect ourselves, whether victim advocacy for those that are literally being exploited, to those that need more information about local bills that are impacting them specifically because there are still people within that state. We also have provided polls for the state statewide where we asked people if they truly understand what's going on in, their, in these fracking wells that are going all over because it's all over this outfit for the extractive industry. And this poll was crucial because it helped people understand what is really going on locally for their pollution? And two, do they really stand for it? Tomorrow I'm gonna to be speaking on what the results of those polls were, which were incredible. No matter what political party, nobody wants air toxins. No matter what political party, more. We all and the American people are understanding that this is killing us, that the indigenous people have been already enduring and telling people and to invisible ears for years. So that being said, I find it incredibly crucial to unite all of our narratives statewide and nationally to each other, especially the Southwest communities and tribes. I find it incredibly crucial to try to have, like I said, saturation of information to the communities and both being affected and having access to really, to real healthcare, even if it's gorilla healthcare and understanding what that really means in going into those areas. Because if we're not going to get the protection, we still have the responsibility of taking care of these communities ourselves for those that have the privilege and affluence to, to still be able to. So I'm very grateful to be able to have this, this connection with all of you. I, I ask that you, I'll leave my, my email in the chat, that anything you want to see what we're doing in Colorado, I can help forward to you and any type of bridge that we can help display that there for Chuckle, I'm down to do. So I'm very grateful for all of you. Um, I would love to continue this conversation as it's gonna be needed for our future generations. So thank you. Jeremy, can we play, can we bear with us as we try to play one video submission? So. so just in sort of response to some of Renee and Hazel's comments related to um, communication of these activities in uh, Diné specific communities, uh, one of the members of the Greater Chaco Coalition, um, Louise Benali, made a video. Let's give me a second to pull this up. Bear with me. Um, made a video in Diné of explaining the fracking impacts. Um, so I'm going to sh share my screen and do that now.
Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Um, I've been following uh, public comments uh, for quite some time about methane leaks. And methane is such a dangerous greenhouse gas. I think maybe you should consider mentioning that also. Um, it's something like 25 times or so more 
dangerous than carbon dioxide, which would result from burning the methane. We get water and carbon dioxide. Both of those gases are um, greenhouse gases, and both are dangerous gases. And if you ask people why there's so much flooding going on around the world, not just in this country, part of that is because of all the fossil fuels we are burning. We're creating water by doing that, and it has to land somewhere. Um, also, there's so much advancement in renewable energy now that we are rapidly getting to the stage where the fossil fuels will be used for making medicines, not for frivolous travel around our cities or for uh, doing other things that are just wasteful. They end up in the landfill. We, we use petroleum uh, processes to make plastics that are really products that are, uh, should be, they're not worth the energy it costs to make them. And yet we're making them out of fossil fuels. So the need for the fossil fuels is driving the fracking operations. We need to minimize everybody's need to consume. And I don't know if there's a way that the Chaco people can create a message that speaks to that need for people living in our big cities where most of the consumption is happening. But if we can't dry up that consumption with practical solutions to the problem, it's likely the fracking will go on anyway. So we have to, we have to get people to stop using the fossil fuels. That means looking for more efficient and effective methods of um, using energy. And there are many renewable energy solutions for that. I'm a member of the New Mexico Solar Energy Association. And over the years, I've been a member now for 30 years, um, I've seen a lot of answers to the problem of using fossil fuels. And um, in fact, I was a judge at uh, New Mexico State Science Fair and I saw a Navajo uh, young woman who had a display about how she's using solar energy to help improve life around her Hogan. Um, and I think there are many ways renewable energy can be used in remote places. So the fossil fuels that are needed just to get water to some places will become a thing of the past. And that's rapidly happening now. Um, battery solutions are happening that allow people to generate energy from many different sources. It could be wind, it could be solar, it could be geothermal, it could be chemical, it could be uh, biofuels. There's many ways that we can now do that minimize our need for any kind of fossil fuel. But I, I'm one of those people that think we can't stop the use of fossil fuels. We have to minimize it. The, the medical industry, for example, uses a lot of things that come out of um, the fossil fuels. Until we have the bioplastics to replace the ones that are coming from the fossil fuels, the medical industry is gonna keep trying to get the fossil fuels. We have many, many uh, built-in addictions to oil and coal in the way our current establishment functions. And that's the big juggernaut that is causing the fracking issues to happen all over the world. Even in the North Pole area, there, there have been issues with Earth Peace trying to get them to stop drilling up there, okay? So the bigger, the most important issue is how do we get people to find ways to live better with less energy? And we have to get that message to the people living in these cities that are wasting energy every time they go to the store. Um, also, well, I said that methane, uh, the, anytime we connect a pipeline that delivers uh, methane, which is basically the natural gas that they're trying to frack and, and uh, oil that, you know, I'm talking about the methane right now. The, those pipelines leak at joints. They, there's all kinds of failures. The earth stretches and shrinks and breaks pipelines like that. They're constantly having to fix those. And if we do FLIR monitoring, we can see 
methane leaking out of places. Scientists know how to see that. There have been many reports on that. So if, if you can emphasize how dangerous that part is for the atmosphere, perhaps you can strengthen your message about protecting Chaco. Uh, I, I agree. I, I think Chaco is one of those amazing places on this planet that deserve our full protection of law, period. So that's my statement for today. Excuse me, how do I mute now? I don't see a mute button on my screen. <laughs> mm, lower left, I don't see that. Um, I, do I have to switch to active speaker to see it? Okay. Yes, yes, you did. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, no, tell us in Manayan Hopi Matua, no, Kaewangwa, Tewa Epkita, um, from the um, Hopi and Tewa, um, tribe and um, corn clan. And I just wanted to, um, be on this to learn more about what we can do in terms of our role. I currently work with the, pro, um, the Colorado Plateau Foundation as a program officer. So I've been enjoying learning so far, um, especially with what Renee had to share about what we can do um, and advocate for on our behalf. We do fund a lot of um, organizations who are um, providing advocacy around the greater Chaco area, but I feel like th there needs to be more organizing and collaborating across nations because um, right now our elected official leaders um, are focused on, on other things. And so there's no real community organizing uh, with the public at all happening. Um, I can say that's honestly true for Hopi. Um, and before um, tribes, you know, were created by government, we were um, we were migrating. Uh, a lot of the the native people were migrating, and so our connections lie beyond our reservation. And so, it, uh, you know, it, just because um, uh, these spaces, sacred spaces, fall within reservation boundaries in, in today's society, that's not true that, um, I mean, it, it's not to say that it's not as significant to other, to other um, Native people out there around the world. Um, and so I wanted to just kind of express that concern that um, it does take um, a lot of um, organizing, especially around educating the public in general. Uh, there's a lot of distress with government um, leadership um, here on Hopi and people choose not to vote because they feel like they've, we've never adopted that type of government for organizing our people um, or, or receiving services from federal government. So um, they downright refuse to even um, have any kind of um, a say in the tribal council's decision making at that level. Which, put us, which puts us in a really awkward position as, as a uh, Native community um, that people are not exercising their right to, to have a say because they totally um, are in disagreement with um, our government structure. So there's a lot of challenges in really getting people to, to respond um, and to really identify what their role is when it comes to 
um, advocacy, but also in, in their role and even just um, feeling like they have a say and opinion um, on what's happening around them. So that's kind of like the realities that we face um, around community organizing. You almost have to convince people that their voice is, um, is appreciated and will be acknowledged. Um, so those are some of the complications that um, we face on the daily working within Native communities, especially rural communities. Um, people are more concerned about the health disparities and don't see the connection um, between fracking and um, aren't aware that they can, they can um, develop their own research um, and to develop their own um, tools to be able to combat um, federal policy or even to engage at any level. And so there's a lot of um, education that's still needed uh, working in rural communities. Um, so uh, I just wanted to express that concern um, as you're thinking about your strategies and in, in continuing to um, reach out to the public, um, especially with rural native communities, there's, there's really, really no communication at all happening. And I'm fortunate that I'm able to connect on internet um, here, um, which has been supported by my business that I work for. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have been able to connect to Zoom at all. So those are kind of the challenges that we're up against here locally. Yeah, thanks, Marissa. Thanks, Jeremy. So we're going to pass the mic um, for emceeing for the next indeterminate period of time. Um, I think half hour, hour, Beata, depending on how long you're willing. Um, so Beata, can you check your mic and make sure that we can see you and we can hear you? Hello, my name's Beata. Can you, can you see and hear me? Great. Thank you so much. We're going to pass the mic over to Beata, another Frack Off Chaco Coalition member, to MC the next hour and call on me if you need anything or help in the meantime. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca and Jeremy. Mumbiakindi, ne huahi wopovi, ne hapo winge omu, navitoa ke omu. I'm from Santa Clara Pueblo. As you know, um, as many of you know, Pueblo communities have really close ancestral ties to Greater Chaco area, one of our ancestral homeland sites. Um, very important place of connectivity to Pueblo people. Um, so this Fraca of Greater Chaco coalition is dear to my heart. I work with Table Women United's Environmental Health and Justice Program. Um, and TWU is a member of the coalition. So I just want to, you know, reiterate um, why we're here today. Thank you all for joining. You know, the Bureau of Land Management and Bureau of Indian Affairs are threatening to frack more of the greater Chaco landscape. Navajo Nation and other tribal nations and communities are experiencing disproportionate impacts of coronavirus. Um, price of oil and gas has dropped and now the Trump administration is soliciting comment on a plan that would add between 2,000 to over 3,000 new industrialized fracking wells within communities across the greater Chaco landscape. And because of our advocacy efforts, the public comment deadline on the fracking plan was extended from May 28th to September 25th. The BLM and BIA have held virtual meetings to solicit public comment but too many of the most impacted people were unable to attend. Um, access to internet and bandwidth is very limited in rural communities. And although many people are also not able to participate in today's people's hearing, we hope to create this unrestricted space to provide comments on the fracking plan and we'll submit this hearing to BLM as part of the official record. We're also calling on our federal agencies to do better and fulfill their promises. The BLM and BIA must solicit meaningful tribal consultation, which includes free prior and informed consent. At a minimum, the BLM and BIA must hold meaningful tribal consultation, um, public meetings in the, in the same way, Navajo and Pueblo communities. 
the agencies previously identified as impacted by this fracking plan. The, Grado, the Greater Chaco Coalition continues to demand a resource management plan that prioritizes public health and safety, air and water, and the protection of cultural resources and the sacred landscape over any more fracking. So even as oil and gas prices have fallen, the administration continues to bail out the oil and gas industry. Today we say Greater Chaco is not a sacrifice zone and we call on the administration to put people first. The people's hearing follows principles of democratic organizing. If there are elected officials, local community elder or indigenous voices that would like to speak first, please send us a chat to jump on the speaker queue. Um, let me make sure my, okay, my battery was low. So again, I wanna just send a call out to all community members if you're joining in um, to please jump on and submit your comments. Um, we really need everybody's voices um, to contribute to this issue. We need all the support we can get. We need commitment at a lot of different levels. Um, and I think, you know, we have to really resist these pushing forward of um, environmental violence agendas in this time of global pandemic is, um, in my opinion, is unconscionable. Um, so yes, it's good we have an extension, but there also we need to really reevaluate what it is we can live without, you know, and what is what is vital. So um, I just wanted to share a poem with you all today. It can go on the record um, as public comment. Uh, it's a poem that I read for Environment Day at the Roundhouse. And it talks about our ancestral ties to um, the Chaco region. It's called Protect Greater Chaco. Is this an okay time to do this, Rebecca? Yeah, okay. Protect Greater Chaco. Direct connection, responsibilities of spirit. Acknowledging center place within vast landscapes. Ancient lineage stored in cliffside memories. Pueblo spoken histories and petroglyph archives of where we came from before coming here. Chaco Canyon is one of these places. People stayed, built, learned, suffered, and for a brief moment thrived. Lessons of hardship, sustainability in times of drought, a prayed in land, experiences that imprinted survival on the descendants of today, truth in our cultural existence, reflecting when we mapped galaxies and spirals of cosmic time with humble flesh and stone, containing brilliance of ancestral astronomers, scientists, architects, and engineers. Our peoples were always these while remaining grounded in journeys of planting seeds in earth, tracking time seasonal passing and matriarchal memory gifted to our future. Chaco roadways are so far reaching extending into ceremony, trade routes, earth honoring relations, architectural genius centered in land-based universities, sacrifices of sweat, blood, and labor offered up for medicine ways, clear purpose in honoring the pathway of a life-giving star. Precious is water in desert landscapes. Priceless is the sovereign right to protect this place laid to rest by our grandparents whose very bones, tears, and laughter is stored in vibrational energy. Glimpses of stone faces memorialized on monolithic mountains and mesas. This great landscape preserved by song and planetary guidance is now being desecrated by theft. Meaningless crisscrossed crucifixion as oil rigs carve out roads of today's demise. Ceremony erased by ugly ruts and man camps. Universal vibration does not align with the low moan of constant drilling. Penetrating elder lands with forced corporate violation. Chaco's matriarchal children did not consent. Grandchildren divided and conquered as treaty rights to consultation are not honored. 
manipulated into believing in the religion of capitalism, water squandered in exchange for radioactive existence, chemical subsistence is replacing our blood and cells, water will go into hiding to preserve self, will our children be able to call our water back, heal division in memory when they can no longer read the stars, when all that is real is thirst and hunger from colonial taking, we must not join forces with greedy ghosts. Fracking is awakening what was put to rest. We have been at these unholy crossroads before. We remain strong as peoples who chose to be free. Extractive actions of ill intent with no ancestral guidance to possess an illusion of wealth. Sovereign authority never ceded these treasures of spiritual and cultural integrity. Houses of living ancients still stands. Resistance is collectively centered. We remain to stop this oppression of stolen native lands. Thank you. So that was first read at uh, Environment Day in January this year at the New Mexico Roundhouse. So I wanted to share that poem with you and open it up now for people signed up to speak. Um, so we have Jeremy Nichols. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> Lawrence Walker. Okay, we'll get back to us, Lawrence, if you get on. Sophia Jeffrey. Sophia Jeffrey, are you on? Okay, next person on the list. Um, forgive my pronunciation, Mayen Barudin. Maybe I'll say some of those people on that list have, uh, we've called their name and we'll continue to post them, but they're not here yet. Let's start with uh, Shana Oliver. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you for um, taking my um, comments. Um, I, I currently reside in um, Denver, Colorado. Um, so, but I am a mother of four children. Um, we are tribal, we do have our tribal census numbers for the Navajo Nation. Um, currently, currently, um, I'm working as a field organizer with Moms Queen Air Force, working in and for um, better legislation and policy for cleaner air for all children, um, not just for Colorado, but speaking up at the EPA hearings on federal um, policies that dictate what polluters can do, as well as um, the lack of uh, monitoring is what has has brought our environment to what it is today um, since the EPA was informed until the 1970s and being a descendant of of genocide for you we have generational trauma as well as displacement and along with um, not just indigenous people but Latino immigrants and African American um, people are systematically segregated into communities disproportionately impacted by air and water and land pollution. And we lack that re representation in the in the in um in these um entities like the BIA and the BLM um as well as the EPA that they hold these um policies 
over our land. And it's time for the BLM and the BIA to ensure that they actually are um, protecting our land and our children's future. Because the Navajo Nation has been a target for coal, uranium, oil and gas extraction because of the treaties um, that are, that is recognized. Um, and people don't understand that these treaties don't really, weren't really in agreement, but forced upon indigenous people. And people don't realize that of how much um, these policies are not in indigenous people's favors or communities. And it lacks our right to clean air, water, as well as land, because our lands are being depleted and are being degraded. And what will our children be able to um, harvest from as we get, as time goes forward? Which is why I, I don't really hear enough people um, speaking about these issues since um, for generations we've been um, excluded from the conversation, as well as our concerns continue to be disregarded by um, these these same these same um, entities like the BLM and the BIA. They still continue to ignore um, people of the community that are being impacted and have said something. They continue to ignore the the impacts that people already feel. They continue to ignore the health impacts that um, indigenous people um, have, which we have the highest rates of asthma, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, leukemia, mental illness, um, adverse birth outcomes, and premature deaths than the general population. And I'm I'm a person that was born prematurely, and I was born on the Navajo Reservation. And I was birth, uh, low birth weight and with the birth effect. And just like many of the children there, as well as uh, many of the Navajo people that do have birth effects, we don't grow up knowing about them until we get older. We don't know that we have a birth effect when we're born, not until um, we're older and we see that something's different and we're impacted differently. Um, based on those um, health, health compromises that are compromising for fossil fuel industry. And bridging um, these issues with community and how tribes receive their money, it has to change because we need to see the BLM and the BIA ensuring like the infrastructure of groundwater usage, um, fracking, uses a lot of ground um, fresh water as well um, using water period um, degrading and depleting our water sources that should be um, a high priority of protecting people's um, access of clean water and ensuring that we have clean air and that leaks are not um, putting us in more in in vulnerable situations of um, of the health impacts of being exposed to those toxic air um, exposures that they don't talk about the benzene and the cancer that as well as the the VOCs which is the the um, volatile organic compounds that are being released while they are extracting and we we need to ensure that the community members know these impacts and the BLM and the BIA need to ensure these same um, things that the community um, are informed about these environmental impacts as well as health impacts and what we should be doing as a community to move away from these things. And just I want to say, say thank you for um, making this um, comment possible for everybody.
Thank you very much. Please spread the word. Share this on your Facebooks. Invite people to join in. Um, we're going to move on to the next speaker, Michael Lipkin. Oh, sorry, Michael Lipkin already went. We should check him out. Oh, okay. Um, just keep going down the list then. Okay, Linda Starr. Are you on, Linda Starr? Give her one a few more seconds. I can't see the entire list of people who are on. So um, Linda Starr, you're up next. You can hear me. Okay, we'll come back. To, we'll come back to you, Marissa Nuva Yestawa. She went. Oh, she was earlier. Um, okay, next, Joshua Tenecker. Okay. Stephen Harris, are you on? Stephen Harris. Okay. Felina Romero. Hello, everybody. I hope everyone's having a good day. Um, my name is Felina Romero. Um, one thing that I have to begin to question, because I question everything itself, is like, what, why is this happening? Um, so, you know, we're doing online schooling, right? And as I'm doing online schooling and going to the hearings, um, I literally came up with a topic about Hitler and how he literally did not like a certain race and he placed them in these concentration camps so he could put them in gas chambers and you know as i'm going up against this battle i'm realizing that they're doing the same thing they're placing gas chambers in front of people's homes And it is a form of annihilation itself because violence against the land is violence against the body. And of course, like she was saying before, it affects the women um, giving the birth. Water is super important because when a baby's inside of a womb, she's just carried in so much water throughout the whole timing. We literally need water to pour on our plants in order to eat. We literally have the cycle of water when, you know, the water goes up and it condensates, it comes back down. So the toxic chemicals go up to the sky and it comes back down towards us. And along with the flaring and the methane going off to the sky, it, it traps, it goes into the ozone layer and then the methane traps in the atmosphere and it causes the carbon, I mean, it causes the temperatures to rise. Um, so that's why we're having high amounts of temperature, I mean, temperatures rising along with the ice melting and then the water is beginning to rise. So fracking itself is literally throwing off the whole life cycle itself. And after, you know, they frack, we end up with this produce water. It's poison water. And then they're just left with it to store it or place it somewhere else, like they did with the nuclear stuff. So we're left 
after they make all this money, we're left with their trash. And they're not gonna pick it up because they already got their money. They already did what they wanted to. And um, um, I think that's all I got, but I'm happy everyone's here and connecting and nice seeing a lot of you guys still fighting the good fight and I appreciate every single one of you so much. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Felina, we appreciate you too. Next up. Uh, we have Kelly Francisco. Are you on? Kelly Francisco? I do, but maybe you should take that, take on the list. Okay, Penelope, on. I'm, I'm here and listening and learning, and I appreciate everyone's statements and all the work that went into organizing this. And um, of course, I'm very much opposed to fracking, and it's, it's just a continuation of the way um, the U.S. has used the indigenous people that were here um, and ignoring the fact that most of us U.S.ers are, we're white people here on land that belongs to the indigenous people. So thank you very much and I will keep listening and learning. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Jeremy, I'm going to look to you to see who's on and. <laughs> okay, let's see. Next. Uh, hey, while we're waiting. Oh, we got to meet your mic. That's me. All right, how's that? Is that better? All right, well, can I, I, can I uh, share a video? Oh, did somebody have a question? I, I was going to say, can I say one more thing? Uh, yeah. Um, um, I just want us all to recognize um, that we're the ones causing it as well. So rather than going for a drive, try to walk places and, you know, skateboard or ride a bike places to cut down on your dependency on these fossil fuels, along with cutting down on plastic. Really, really important. Um, so that involves recycling. Um, when you guys are getting rid of stuff, donate it. Um, it's super important. I go to thrift, store, thrift stores and I find amazing stuff. My mom has always, like, we live in like a low income and housing complex and I literally, we literally live in the rich neighborhood because <laughs> the way things are set up, but they literally throw away brand new stuff and teaching people the importance to give, give back to people or to give to the thrift stores or give to somebody you think this will be good for. Um, I just wanted to also point that out. Um, that, sorry. I think you cut out, Felina. Oh, when did it cut out? There you go. When did it cut out? Oh, uh, not very much. Just about. So just cut, cut down on dependency with fossil fuels, ride, bike, uh, ride your bike and walk places, and donate your stuff, your clothes. Donate your clothes. Donate your, um, your dressers and stuff. If you start looking old, Paint it, be creative. Um, 
just try to recycle and be as sustainable as you most possibly can. And that's, that's what I would say. Thank you. Okay, Jeremy, who's next? We're going to show a video now. I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, Rebecca got a video that she was going to share. Yeah, I'm going to try. Can you hear me? I'm going to do it. We can do it. We do not have a written language. So the places that we go to, that we pray to, are really the chapters of that history book. What if pages of that history were erased forever? This is Chaco Canyon in northern New Mexico. A thousand years ago, it was a ceremonial center built by one of the most fascinating cultures of the ancient world. Here, the ancestors of today's Pueblo Indians built 14 great houses the largest buildings in North America until the 19th century. The discovery of a spiral rock carving, which marks with light the key points in the solar and lunar cycles, led to findings that these massive buildings are also precisely aligned to the cycles of the sun and moon. Much mystery surrounds the Chacoans, who left no written texts Current research depends on the wider Chaco world, which flourished throughout a 70,000 square mile area of the American Southwest. But that legacy is at risk, and the Chaco region is becoming an industrial wasteland. Fracking and horizontal drilling are now able to reach oil that lies a mile below the surface here. The Bureau of Land Management is planning for massive oil and gas development within 6.2 million acres surrounding Chaco Canyon. In addition to considerable risks to this fragile environment, tribal people and researchers feel we will lose sacred cultural resources. The buildings that lie within the Chaco Canyon National Park are protected. But the vast majority of Chacoan buildings and ancient roads are found outside of the park. At least 35 Great House sites are within the 6.2 million acres the BLM is facilitating for development. Like the Great Houses of the Canyon, these sites were also elaborate ceremonial centers. But many have not been excavated and can be very subtle and difficult to recognize. At greatest risk are ancient roads, 30 feet wide and remarkably straight. Researchers are only beginning to understand how these amazing constructions were not intended for travel or trade. These are lines that extend out to particular places that have spiritual significance. This line of energy is establishing the Great House place in spiritual space. The Navajo people have lived for centuries around Chaco. The landlines that are streaming across the country of the entire landscape are sacred. And they're recited in our ceremonial ways. I think the roads are crucial to understanding uh, the, the Chacoan system. Every little segment of a road is a piece of that puzzle. And if they're destroyed before we learn about them, you know, we're never going to recover that. We as Pueblo people have an obligation to continue to visit those places with our children and our grandchildren. But we as Americans, as part of the bigger community, also are obligated to protect those chapters of that history book so that future generations can continue to enjoy them. We can protect this national treasure, but it is urgent that our leaders hear from us now. Find out how by following this link. Uh, friends of ours in the, friend, in the Brack Off Chaco Coalition, the Solstice Project. And there's just one more I have, if y'all are, if that sounds good.
do we not talk about that? How do we not talk about how we're completely dismissed out here? I'm not against oil and gas. I drove here in my truck. I am aware of that. But I feel as though it should just be stopped right now and reassessed. Because people assume that this is just desert, but they don't think about the people who live there, people who have lived here for generations. Where, where are we going to go? What's going to happen? Those are questions that you know, come to our mind daily. These places now are just being torn apart, ripped up, it's treated like nothing. And that's kind of how we feel we're being treated. The BLM is offering some of these tribal trust lands for oil and gas leases, not even considering the people that live on that landscape. Only the surface was designated as tribal trust lands. The mineral rights remained with the federal government. So you can have a house sitting on trust land for the home site, but right next door to you is BLM public land and they can, they can drill under your house because you have no rights to the soil under your house. Documents that are presented that to them, they don't even show where people live on these parcels of land. This is our land. This is what was given to us. After, after people came in and stole our land that we lived on and claimed it as theirs, we were only given a small portion to live on. And now you guys are coming over here and fracking and do as you guys please on our land? Don't, don't, no, we don't want it here. It's us as humans, us as people. Our, our lives are at stake. There's increases in asthma. People have been diagnosed with COPD and cancer. Have you seen the New Mexico Department of Health study of San Juan County? The highest cancer rates in New Mexico. It's not rocket science. These facilities, they are releasing the high volumes of uh, methane gases and volatile organic compounds. Like, we know that whole saying, water is life. Yeah, thousands of thousands of pounds of, of methane in the air. And they think the people will, will, will survive through this. Oh, they think their, their money is worth more than, than, than our lives, than our livelihood, than the land that we, that we live on. And that's the whole mindset, I guess, of the industry is profit over people. There is lies that were told to the community member to, to give up their land. So it'll create jobs. It'll help your it'll help your town. Now, twelve to fourteen million dollars was made out here. We don't have any new schools out here. We don't have new parks. We don't even have a fire department. They don't have respect for us. They don't have respect for our land. They don't have respect for our women. People should be more important than oil. Should be more important than gas. Should be more important than than anything else. In July of this year we had an, an explosion and 36 barrels of oil burned for th over three days right next to a, a small little area of a family that lives there. And instead of coming out and extinguishing it and treating it like a hazardous site, they didn't care. Whereas when I lived in Southeast Kansas, I saw the, the good side of oil and gas. I saw the jobs that were, were brought into the community. I saw when they put in a site, they fenced it off to keep kids out, to keep livestock out. They communicated with them. They had a total different respect for the people in the community. Their First Nation, they were here before we were. Uh, this is their land. We need to be respecting it as such. If you're, if you're in Illinois or Oregon, like, submit comments. That's one of the easiest things you could do to help us out here we shouldn't be afraid of each other and we shouldn't be afraid of the industry. We shouldn't be afraid of speaking for our home. And that one came from another volunteer uh, working with the Frack Off Chaco Coalition and We'll be playing more of those. Those 843 parcels that were mentioned were, I believe they were done in, in 2018. They were actually deferred, um, but most of the content in that video is still relevant today.
Should we continue with comments? Yeah. So next up, I believe who's on is Rob, R Roberta Zayas. Is that correct, Jeremy? Oh, she might have dropped off. Um, okay. Let me see. Oh, uh, next is uh, Anson. Anson, right? Saw him on. Is Anson right on? If, uh, if you are Anson, if you're talking, you need to unmute yourself. Okay. I'll let you go down the list, Jeremy, and I'm happy to read another poem. Yeah, let's see. So we're, we're trying to, you know, obviously this hearing, people are popping in and out. So we're trying to see who's here and compare it with the list so that we make sure we get everybody in. Um, but yeah, uh, I think a poem would be great. Yeah, let's, go ahead, Beata. Let's see a couple more names if anybody's on real quick. Okay, all right, let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, Looks like uh, Veronica uh, Toledo. I see Veronica on the participant list. Oh. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Can, hear you. can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes, yeah. we can hear you. Go ahead. Um, yet Ash A. Veronica Toledo Yenish, a Shehanish Lin Nakai, Bush Shimbut Anidus Che Nakanish Nella. Hello, my name is Veronica. Um, you guys can call me Yang. I'm a steering committee member of the Youth United for Climate Crisis Action and a spokesperson on behalf of my indigenous people and Dinan nations in the Four Corners area. I am originally from Farmington, but I recently graduated at New Mexico School for the Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And so I have been advocating in Santa Fe for a couple years. And I have often been faced with this um, reoccurring battle with the Bureau of Land Management and also the BIA um, with the decisions of fracking around or on Chaco, around the Chaco region. And um, I was first introduced to it at a young age at my, in my freshman year when I went to uh, Santa Fe Indian School. And that was when I really was introduced to the fracking industry and what they were doing to my Diné homelands. And for centuries, people of this land have been fighting over the earth, and oil companies should not be able to drill on historic landmarks of the indigenous communities. And since Native people have been on this continent, we have protected our homelands from desecration that tribal, federal, and land governments have sacrificed our people's homelands for many centuries. These desecrating decisions are affecting the earth and causing climate change. These are impacting the in frontline communities that are the most vulnerable, who oftentimes do not have adequate resources such as food, medicine, shelter, and even clean water and clean air. Um, these desecrating decisions are affecting the um, uh, animal species as well and vast amounts of people's health and in, in, in most impactful indigenous traditional lifestyles. Um, we have a sacred con connection with the Chaco region and the time that our ancestors were there. We, we need to understand the universal knowledge and we need to maintain our cultures. But you know, when we have colonizational um, targetings our people, it's really hard to keep that connection 
or even just to be able to go back to our homelands and help our people. Uh, for many centuries, native land has been sold without the warning of people, sold to oil and gas companies for millions of dollars, and traditional sacred grounds are being most specifically targeted, and we have a sacred duty to fulfill as the seventh generation. We must protect Mother Earth and all her creatures on it. We indigenous people know this land, so we must take care of the earth and take care of the water for future generations. The land that holds great knowledge are being destroyed for energy fuel. And native people occupy these homelands for ceremonies, but we could not participate in our ceremonies if we and our homelands are being sold away to be destroyed by the black prophecy of the black snake. Um, and so I'm just really concerned about the environment and the animals and the species, especially my people, because so for generations we haven't been heard. And right now is a time where we go back to our traditional ways and we find out that the white men's world and the white men's um, industries cannot, pro cannot only profit us, but also does not fit in our, um, in our lifestyles. So I believe that we must have strategized mobilization as indigenous communities to take back our homelands and to help our people. And that just starts with being um, knowledgeable with what's going on with the earth. And I am just really um, overwhelmed with this, continuing forward with wanting to frack on the lands when the Navajo Nation is one of the third most highest uh, states, not even including other states that has the most highest epidemic rates. And it's really just devastating to see how many people are losing their lives, how many families are losing members of their family, just to see people sacrificing to be in in society and that's really heartening because i live in like like the most racist place in new mexico and it, a couple days ago we had an incident where people were doing a rally at the farmington mall and we see all kinds of injustices happening around the world and i think that's just a way to see how we're being treated and we need to realize that we have the power within us and we just got to ignite it and so I just really want you guys to know that we have the power, we have the courage, and we have the strength, and we always have. We just need to mobilize ourselves and get ourselves organized to help our people more than ever. And we have a sacred duty to fulfill and that we cannot be intimidated by the black snake and the oil companies because they're the ones that are trying and cheering on genocide for not even generations, but for the future generations and I, I'm just very happy to be giving a comment upon my people and speaking. I, I really don't like speaking on behalf of my elders because they have more knowledge and they know more than I do. Um, so forgive me, any um, Native elders that are out there, if I'm speaking before you. But um, I appreciate it. And um, I just hope that we just continue to stay strong and stay healthy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. Next we have Mimsy Milton. Mimsy Milton. Yeah, I'm here. I'm just here to listen. I'm not planning to speak, but thank you. Okay. Thanks for joining, Mimsy. Sure. Next on the list is Rebecca Simon. Uh, hello. Uh, I also was, uh, uh, am participating in uh, support and respect and uh, knowledge of uh, all our partners um, from Colorado. So thank you for providing this platform for folks to have a voice. Thank you for joining. Next, would Patricia Kooning like to give comments? Patricia Kooning? I 
I see Patricia. Okay, Patricia Kooning will give you a minute. Might have to go back. Okay. All right, Patricia will make a note to come back to you. Maybe she may have stepped away for a minute. Um, next is Paula Krizen. Paula Krizan, would you like to say, say some comments? Paula? Okay. Is there anybody else I'm missing, Jeremy? Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Margaret Wadsworth. Who I know Rebecca brought on to be the next okay. MC. But if she wants to comment, Margaret. Yeah, I'll. Comment? No, you can just let me know um, when you're ready to to switch over. Thanks. Okay. okay. Well, maybe for um, this last five minutes when I'm on with you all, I'll do another poem. I really appreciate everything that's been said up to this point. Um, I appreciate the solidarity with indigenous communities. Just want to continue everyone to create meaningful relationship with tribal nations, with indigenous peoples, to go beyond the land acknowledgements um, and to First and foremost, start doing those if you're not already within your um, advocacy groups or organizations or um, whoever you're speaking with. You know, the land acknowledgements are very important to center ourselves and where we are in place, to align our values um, of love, respect, and care with each other and for our land. And then to, we have a, there's a big responsibility to take that to the next level for native liberation, for return of stolen lands, for the return of BLM management to tribal nations, in my opinion. Um, you know, a lot of these, we can't forget the systemic issues of how we got in these situations in the first place. And um, like it's been said, we are the ones who know how to take care of this place, the indigenous peoples of this place. We are this place. And you cannot separate people from themselves. Um, so it's really important that, you know, if you're listening, if you're participating, that you, you take those steps to create long-term meaningful reciprocal relations with the communities around you. Um, and yeah, I think the issues go, go really far back in colonial history of New Mexico. And so it's, it's, it's important that everyone um, is informed on that history as well. So I'm gonna read this poem. Um, it's about indigenous solidarity. Living within nurturing grandparent mountains of my birth, Six directions enclose our center place within Tewa existence, Diné existence. My heart beating is generations of seasonal breaths, is water moving from sky to earth and back to sky. Our weathered hands giving prayers to corn mothers as they are planted gently to begin new cycles of infancy. In soil that loves seeds in ways only earth baptized in blood can. Intimacy with death and resistance, Ancestors' bones fiercely loving our gardens into being. Revolution released from the pores of torment and torture. The resilient dignity of farmers named after places they fought for. Taking on masks of violence, it had to be done. 
becoming what was hated in order to survive more intact than what was intended for them, preserving what genocide would have destroyed, our fight today is to let go of what no longer serves our survival. The same nobility of mighty milpas sprawled in summer sun. Purity is the covenant of a people to their seeds, of keeping secret spirit warriors' homes in ancient elder peaks. There is ways of life worth dying for, and three military campaigns of colonial violence have tried to diminish this holy place that is Toa, the people. Despite territorial horizons shrunk to reservations, knowingness is held safe in hearts of family, in drumbeats on solstice mornings, and sacred acts of growing food, planting umbilical cords beneath trees who know something of forever and what it means to exist in natural law as part of a collaborative system held in deep roots in relation to spiritual webs that connect us to all and the passing of sparkling water blessed by hands painted white with clay into vessels kissed by creator's own planting water takes on the form that carries them and knows nothing of false political borders truth in liquid constellations that supersedes any man-made laws Indigenous peoples were birthed in their lands for higher purpose, to give love and care and maintain generosity and balance with place. Only evil would attempt to disrupt this. Only wounds suffering this very loss would know how to pass on generational experiences of violence. Covet love and connection that hides in wounds, in wounds of trauma. This taking numbs that memory is a superficial balm for ancient wounds frozen in the cold death between stars, of cords cut while still pumping life, kinship disconnected to land, air, and first origins, stories of forced removal, violent relocation, thunderstorms weep for this pain and severing of soul belonging of peoples everywhere. And here in this place embraced still by elder watersheds, still echoing ancient songs and earth honoring reverence, prayers and plantings that bring rains to desert survival. I walk barefoot daily, gathering plant medicines, grinding food on stone in completion of a lifeway, holding my children close because these times would steal them from my arms in continuation of agendas never rescinded. Doctrines of discovery upheld on pedestals of skulls and stolen wealth, stolen children and Supreme Court gavels denying the return of homelands, like nuclear waste in barrels that will corrode and release its poison. Someday, we will heal this land. We are still here, and the tactics are the same. The only difference is we are still here. We remain where Creator planted us, some far from the songs of their planting, not by choice, but still in our full strength and power, feeding ancestral energies, Colonial cowardice fears this wholeness, and our limbs reach for elder sun's renewal, knowing a little something of forever, and how water beings cannot be contained by borders, enforced by war and will, and how movement is a natural process, the great return to sky, to earth, and always, this same breath in fragile bodies is an offering for life to continue. Original instructions realized, remembered, to love, respect, and take care of one another so that things will be good for us. Here in this cosmic journey we know as Grandmother Earth, Nanga Chukwajo, where song lines vibrate on spiral portals, our maps for our emergence, a return to spirit's higher self, liberation must be attained, and a return to collaborative systems waiting underground in vast networks. There is still time to dream of children returning home. Thank you. I'll turn it over back over to Rebecca. Thank you so much, Beata, for emceeing. Um, we're going to pass the torch to Margaret Wadsworth from Food and Water Watch for the next hour of emceeing. Margaret, we are still here to support. We've also realized that um, our registration list isn't exactly syncing up with the folks that are on the call. So again, we'll make the call out for if anybody who's on the Zoom call right now wants to give public comment, 
um, please just unmute yourself or say so, and I will pass over to Margaret to start. Ooh, Susan Sherman's gonna go up. So we got Susan next, Margaret, but why don't you open us up and kick us off? Okay, great, can you hear me? Yep, we Sorry, can hear you. I can't see you, you can't hear me, okay. Yep. Sorry, my um, computer's a little slow, so, um, but if you can hear me, I'm just gonna go ahead. My name is Margaret Wadsworth. I am an organizer with Food and Water Watch and Food and Water Action, and we are also a part of the Greater Chaco Coalition. So I am also gonna start out by reading the background information and the RMPA demands. The Bureau of Land Management and Bureau of Indian Affairs are threatening to frack more of the greater Chaco landscape. Navajo Nation and other tribal nations and communities are experiencing disproportionate impacts of coronavirus. The price of oil and gas has plummeted. And now the Trump administration is soliciting comment on a plan that would add between 2,000 to over 3,000 new industrialized fracking wells within communities across the greater Chaco landscape. Because of our relentless calls, the public comment deadline on the fracking plan was extended from May 28th to September 25th. The BLM and the BIA have held virtual meetings to solicit public comment, but too many of the most impacted people were unable to attend. Although many people are also not able to participate in today's people's hearing, we hope to create an unrestricted space to provide comments on the fracking plan and will submit this hearing to BLM as part of the official report. We're also calling on our federal agencies to do better and fulfill their promises. The BLM and BIA must solicit meaningful tribal consultation, which includes free, prior, and informed consent. At a minimum, the BLM and BIA must hold public meetings in the same Navajo and Pueblo communities the agencies previously identified as impacted by this fracking plan. The Greater Chaco Coalition continues to demand a resource management plan that prioritizes public health and safety, air and water, and the protection of cultural resources and the sacred landscape over any more fracking. Even as oil and gas prices have fallen to historic lows, the administration continues to bail out the oil and gas industry. Today, we say Greater Chaco is not a sacrifice zone, and we call on the administration to put people first. The people's hearing follows principles of democratic organizing. If there are elected officials, local community members, elders, or indigenous voices that would like to speak first, please send us a chat to jump the speaker queue. Although, as we just said, um, our list seems a little different from who's participating right now. We wanna make sure everyone who wants to speak has a chance. And so um, the first person up, up next is Susan Sherman. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sue Sherman and um, I appreciate the invitation to submit a comment at this people's hearing. Um, I vehemently oppose fracking in Greater Chaco. I, I vehemently actually oppose fracking anywhere, but to have it be in a place that is held sacred um, by indigenous peoples is so, it makes it even worse. Um, I'm an, I've been an activist uh, on many issues for quite a while, uh, for Palestine liberation against police brutality, uh, for immigration justice. Uh, I volunteer with mutual aid in Albuquerque right now. Um, I'm very active with the nuclear issue study group, which strives to protect New Mexico from all things nuclear. Um, I participate in the Free Them All Fridays prison abolition and also work against racism. Um, but this issue, I, I'm not following it as closely and I'm grateful for the folks that are engaged on the daily or the weekly on this issue. Um, I've been to Chaco once when I first moved to New Mexico 27 years ago and I was so ignorant and yet I could sense how special a place it was and um, I know a lot more now because I've, I've seen the documentary about um, the astro astro astrology parts of the 
of the place, which are so fascinating. Um, but this is a justice issue uh, for religious freedom, um, for health reasons, for environmental justice, and cultural preservation as well. And um, fracking is such a desecration of sacred sites. Um, I referenced Beata's poem, uh, Water Has Been Exchanged for Radiation. Uh, and um, the uranium was mined and made into a bomb and dropped across the other side of the globe, uh, such a sacrilege to do that. Um, we should return this land to the indigenous peoples it was stolen from. And, and that means both on the surface and below ground. Um, so I vehemently oppose the fracking and I, I so deeply appreciate the opportunity to submit this comment to the BIA and the BLM. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much. And um, just a reminder of what Rebecca said that um, we're actually going to ask for an open call of volunteers to for folks who want to speak. So I'm actually going to wait for a second here and see if anyone volunteers either by unmuting themselves or um, maybe writing their name in the chat. So I'll give us a moment here for anyone who wants to speak. Um, hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Hi, Susie, Hi. go ahead. Yeah, hi, um, my name is Susie Schwartz. I live in Taos. Um, I uh, just want to thank you for this amazing meeting. Um, I'm listening, I'm learning. I am like so moved by Beata and everybody's poetry and the, the, the amazing presentation here and plus all the powerful testimony that I have just been hearing and um, I support. I first, uh, went to a Chaco, a frack off Chaco meeting. It was several years ago here in a little room um, here in Taos and have been trying to follow it first at, um, since then. And I, my sort of what I'm really working on the most right now is what's happening at Los Alamos National Laboratory with the huge expansion of plutonium pits and the new Rocky Flat. So that's sort of my main focus, but this is all intrinsically linked and um, I want to do whatever I can to support this movement which is growing and I think I mean it's every it always seems too slow but you know it, it really things are really happening now um, I just have to pray and hope and do whatever we all do whatever we can thank you Thanks, Susie. Thanks for jumping on and sharing and joining us today to learn. And um, I'm going to wait another moment here in case anyone wants to jump in. Margaret, while people are waiting and seeing, I'm happy to play it, one of the videos we've got submitted. OK, great. Sonia, did you want to make a comment? Before yeah, we... um, just one second. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Sonia Grant. Um, can you hear me okay, Margaret? Yes, yes absolutely. absolutely. Awesome, thank you. Um, I, uh, I live in Santa Fe. Um, I'm from uh, Eastern Canada, Nova Scotia. Um, had the privilege of working with the Greater Chaco Coalition um, for the past few years um, and I just want to take a moment to really thank the organizers of this forum. I um, had the opportunity to attend all five of the public, the virtual public meetings, quote unquote, that the Bureau of Land Management um, held in the last couple of weeks. And um, what, one of the things that was the most troubling to me, apart from the fact that the BLM decided to go ahead with these meetings, despite all the calls for an extension um, due to circumstances in, in the current moment. Um, one of the other things that I found most sort of troubling was that um, right before BLM opened their 
public comment period, you know, after giving a brief presentation, they gave the audience very specific directions around what constitutes a good public comment and what constitutes a bad public comment. And I found this super problematic because it, it tried to sort of um, set limits from the get-go around the kinds of knowledge um, that the agency would think about as, as valuable for informing this process. And I think we know that there are lots of different kinds of knowledges and experiences that um, need to be included in this decision-making process. And we've heard a lot of that today. And so I'm just really grateful um, for this forum and the opportunity to listen and, um, and learn. Um, and briefly, I, uh, I want to say regarding the resource management plan amendment that we're um, discussing here, we, we know from local Navajo Nation chapters, we know from Pueblo governments and other tribal governments that there has not been a process of meaningful um, consultation around this plan. Um, and that's enough right there to, to put a pause on this process. Also, we know that the Bureau of Land Management, Farmington Field Office, has never analyzed the cumulative impacts to public health, to climate, to cultural resources. And so I'm really pleased to see all these folks on the call um, asking for that. And I hope that, you know, together we can push these agencies um, to, to put together not just an amendment, but an actual plan that, you know, takes that, that does this work of cumulative analysis, that does this work of meaningful tribal consultation, um, because the last thing that, you know, the region needs right now is any more um, fracking that, you know, and certainly not any more fracking that hasn't been <laughs> analyzed. Um, so yeah, thanks again, and um, I hope everyone stays safe. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you for sharing with us. And Rebecca, if you want to take a moment to show the video, we can do that. And then we can put a call out for the next um, speakers. I can do that. I'm going to show a couple. We've had a um, couple of videos that have been created over the life of working together um, in the Frackoff Chaco Coalition. And so, I'm gonna play two to start that were created from um, a collection of artists working with UNM Land Arts of the American West program. Um, and they'll, they uh, did a fracking reality tour with council delegate Daniel So and talked to many community members and produced these few videos. There are many who call this home and have been in relation here for hundreds, thousands and years more than can be known. Indigenous peoples, Diné and Pueblo, who have cared for the land, waters and one another, acknowledging and protecting the sacredness of place, life, ancestors and future generations. The land, mesas, canyons, springs, cornfields, sheep ranges, grasses, trees, medicine plants, animals, birds, insects, and lizards. Abundance, diversity, strength, taking care, being in relation. Premature birth, birth defects, nausea, vomiting, liver damage, cancer, asthma, difficulty breathing, rashes, bloody nose, dizziness, headaches, confusion, memory loss, fractured lives, depression, anxiety, addiction, trauma, failing, falling, ongoing fear of the unknown and what is known. 94% of public lands in northwest New Mexico is already leased for oil and gas extraction. With over 30,000 wells in the greater Chaco region, and more continuing to be developed, leaving plumes of ruin in their wake. It's now called multi-stage hydraulic fracturing, but most know it by what it does, fracking. But who knows the consequences? Air 
his life. Fumes and droning fill the air from spreading chemicals, burning gas, roads, thundering vibrations, erupting dust, coating the inside of houses, lungs and mines, covering, burying everyone under its weight. How do we breathe? Water is life. Thousands, millions, trillions of gallons. Clean, pure water disappears, becoming toxic. Spills, contamination, produced water. Where does it go? What do we drink? Land is life. Land is home and there is nowhere to go. Well paths, split estates, roads and land loss spreading across and beneath. The plants and animals cannot speak, but they do have a voice. Who, they say, will protect us? Body is life. Women, children and the elderly are most vulnerable, but everyone is affected. Pain, trauma and illness are the family of money, an assumed necessity of life. How do we heal? How do we come together and begin this conversation? Acknowledge that we are all part of this story. In the words of Eileen Shendo, our souls need it. Let's be life. Let's be energy. Let's be that connection. Let's not let anyone feel that alone again. So we're so thankful of all of the different groups that have contributed. Um, that group of artists made this other video too, four in total. Here's the next one. We would like to first acknowledge that this video was created on the traditional lands of the Diné people and express our gratitude and respect. Furthermore, this short video was made possible through the work of inspiring Diné activists, Daniel So, Samuel Sage, Kendra Pinto and Marlene Thomas, as well as Jemez Pueblo activist Eileen Shendo. They gave their blessing for us to amplify their message. Do you hear that? People have inhabited this land for thousands of years. Gas and oil development began in the 1950s and pump jacks started to dot the landscape. During this time, uranium and coal mining brought jobs as well as environmental and health impacts to the region. Around 2009, gas and oil companies began leasing public land to experiment with a new form of drilling. This expanded rapidly, and as of 2019, 94% of public land in San Juan County were leased to oil and gas. Fracking, as it is commonly known, has had a couple of names as the industry tries to downplay its negative connotations. For now, it is referred to as multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. This involves drilling thousands of feet down, just below the aquifer, turning 90 degrees in what is known as a kickoff, then horizontally drilling from a quarter to several miles. The perforating gun is then lowered into the well and creates small holes in the layer of rock. The site is now re ready to be fracked when an unknown mixture of water, sand, and chemicals are forced into the well, making fissures and openings from which a combination of oil and the contaminated fracking water is pumped to the surface. 
The roads and fracking pads began popping up all over the area, sometimes as close as 300 feet from someone's home. The trucks drive up and down the roads, degrading them, making it difficult for residents to go about their daily lives, not to mention the constant noises from the operations. It didn't take long before people began to realize that there was an unknown and unseen danger. Invisible toxic chemicals, known as volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, were leaking into the air around people's homes. They are known to cause cancer, birth defects, developmental disorders, irritation of the nose and throat, vomiting, fatigue, neurological effects, and problems with the nervous system. Concerned community members spoke with the BLM, the federal agency responsible for approving drilling leases. It soon became clear that fracking had been approved without their consultation. Since then, a broad coalition of activists from communities across the region, as well as allies from the New Mexico and U.S. formed. They have worked tirelessly to study the impact of fracking, as well as fight for the people, places, plants, and animals that are all under threat. And the fight continues as dangers grow. Explosions, spills, and fires have become horrifying reality on these sites. These problems will only grow worse unless we, as a people, stand together to fight the greedy companies that profit off of fracking. Do you hear that now? those videos in the chat. Go ahead, Margaret. Okay, great. Thank you so much for showing those videos. And just, um, just to reiterate, you're going to share the videos in the chat, but they will also be posted on the Frack Off Taco website and Facebook page. Is that correct? Yes, they are, are actually all already posted on the Frack Off Taco page somewhere. <laughs> um, but we will oh, okay, great. Page. All right, perfect. Well, we're ready um, for anyone else who wants to share a comment. So um, if you can either unmute yourself and um, say your name or write your name in the chat. We'll wait a few moments um, before doing another presentation. Hey, um, Margaret, I'll, I'll just say a few words real quick. Um, you know, I've been kind of holding off. I want to give everybody else a chance to speak. But um, as I said uh, at the beginning, my name is Jeremy Nichols. I'm the Climate Energy Program Director for Wild Earth Guardians, which is a member of the Frack Off Chaco Coalition and has been, uh, you know, working together with lots of allies and partners on the front lines to defend the greater Chaco region for many years. And I, I just want to, um, I, I just want to thank everybody who is still here and who has shown up. Um, who participated in this people's hearing. This was our attempt to uh, provide a, a retort to the Bureau of Land Management and the Bureau of Indian Affairs and their uh, absolutely pathetic uh, attempts at public engagement around their plans to expand fracking in the greater Chaco region. Um, they held a series, as we've heard, a series of uh, virtual, uh, quote, public meetings over the past couple weeks. And uh, the meetings were an absolute sham. Um, we couldn't see people over video. We couldn't interact with the agency. And we said, screw that. We're going to do our own hearing where people can be on video. They can speak out as long as they want and on what they want. They won't be judged on whether their comments are good or bad. Uh, and we will, we will document it all and give it to the agency. So, um, you know, this is so inspiring and so uh, amazing um, and to be able to provide this forum, this space for people to, to feel safe, to feel like they're being heard. And, and I just want to acknowledge that we are hearing you and we want to make sure that the agencies hear you too. So, um, you know, we had a lot of people at the beginning, which was great. I know it's dwindled a bit, but thank you for hanging in there. And please, like, tell people if, if you've got friends who might be interested in this, we're going to be on as long as it takes to make sure that we're documenting people's comments and we're getting people on the record about how they feel about this plan to expand fracking in Greater Chaco. And we want uh, people to see the faces behind 
uh, what's happening in the greater Chaco region. And I'm so honored to be a part of this hearing today and hearing all the comments from people who are on the front lines, who are being directly impacted. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an honor. Uh, it's also um, very motivating. And it makes me realize, um, yeah, we need to be digging in uh, more deeply than ever to fight back, to defend the greater Chaco region from fracking, and to thwart the oil and gas industry's plans to absolutely decimate this region. So I just want to say thank you again to everybody and just share a little bit of that background in terms of where this people's hearing concept came from. And uh, we'll keep at it uh, to make sure everybody gets a chance to be heard. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jeremy. And um, Ralph, if you'd like to go next to give a comment, um, you can unmute yourself. So you're still muted. Um, hold on a second. So Ralph Ross. Oh, I see that you're unmuted. You are up. Great, thanks for um, unmuting me because I was I was frantically trying to find where I could do that. Hi, my name is Ralph Rons, and as others have said, um, I greatly appreciate this opportunity to hear from others on this, and I have learned a lot. Um, and while I have been following the issues uh, re related to oil and gas drilling, and particularly fracking in the Greater Chaco area and have submitted comments, I'm, I always seem to be at a loss for all of the specifics. Um, so this, this uh, Facebook Live um, People's Hearing has really helped me. Uh, I want to also thank um, the Greater Chaco Co Coalition for setting this all up. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of give a checkerboard of, of comments on this thing. Uh, first off, I'll start off with saying that um, and by the way, I am uh, a 30-year New Mexico resident, and I'm a, a resident of Albuquerque. Um, I have attended a fracking reality tour uh, given by Daniel So, uh, Kendra Pinto, and Mario Atencio, with a number of others uh, in August of last year. So that gave me a, a good um, exposure to what's going on in that area. Of course, not, not front lines like the, the residents of that area are experiencing all the time. I've also committed, I'm um, sorry, submitted comments uh, that have been organized in the past by Pueblo Action Alliance, uh, and that has really helped um, me with getting my um, my comments across. Uh, otherwise, I, I may not, I may have missed, you know, issues that were related to lease forthcoming lease sales by BLM. Um, there's a glut of oil on the world markets, and the price of oil has plummeted, as we've been hearing uh, on this hearing. Now is the time to take a pause in plans to prioritize oil and gas drilling. This is the time to fully examine the deleterious impacts of hydraulic fracturing. We need to prioritize public health and safety. I am opposed to BLM's continued agenda of rubber stamping the oil and gas industry's demands without adequate public notice or engagement and a chronic, and a chronic lack of response to public protests. As was also said earlier in this, um, in this hearing, um, BLM needs to announce hearings on the radio. And they also need to hold these hearings on the, in the impacted communities of the Great Ochaco landscape area. Uh, not just hold them on far off regions, you know, but maybe, maybe Albuquerque's not far away or maybe Farmington's not far away, but they really need to hold them in the immediate areas of where the impacts are being held. Um, so that, that's an important thing to get across. Um, when I was talking about that I'm opposed to BLM's continued agenda, this was actually a comment that I submitted as part of some uh, individualized comments on one of the um, efforts that were being coordinated by the Pueblo Action Alliance. And I ended up receiving a form letter, certified letter from BLM 
uh, state office saying that my comments were being dismissed because they were part of a, um, I wish I had it in front of me right now, but basically they were saying that I had submitted a form letter when in fact I had not done so. Um, I gave individualized comments, which I'll read again right now. Um, as I signed on to the greater com comments that were provided that indicated which lease sales were being um, opposed. So I said in there, I completely disagree with the energy dominance agenda of the Trump administration and how it has been callously carried out by Zinke and Bernhardt. Without regard for public law, Native American sovereignty, and the rights of farmers and ranchers and of the general public. I am in complete agreement with the notion of a four-year moratorium on new leasing of public lands, BLM in particular, for fracking until we learn fully the impacts of fracking. And I also added to that, that, and I back up my words on this with actions. Um, in my time here in New Mexico, I've installed many energy efficient and water conserving measures on my house. I bike commuted to work for 30 plus years uh, and I put PV solar on my house and I drive a gas electric hybrid to, to show that if we can truly, as others have pointed out previously in this, uh, in this hearing, we need to reduce our reliance on things coming from fossil fuels. And that's always driven a lot of my actions. And I think that we need to embrace that, um, all of us on this hearing, uh, and I'm sure actually a lot, of, a lot of people do, but wherever we can do to re reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, that lends more credence to everything that we ask for. So let's see, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, I, I do wanna echo earlier in this hearing, the comments made by Mike Eisenfeld. Uh, I also support the idea of an injunction as stated by Patricio earlier in this people's hearing, um, if that's something that could be plausible. Um, I think we need to take every tack we can because I think that it's, uh, it's an injustice the way in this administration BLM has carried out this agenda um, by ignoring people's comments and by uh, not even being present in their state office at the time of a, uh, of a protest. Um, I think, oh, and then I'll just close by saying that Greater Chaco as it is not a sacrifice zone. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Ralph. And we are still open for, um, for open commenting, if anyone else um, has been waiting to share. I just want to comment real quick on what Ralph said. I really appreciate that feedback because it's so important to highlight how the Bureau of Land Management uh, is not interested in reading our comment letters and you know, actively ignores them. And we need to do everything we can to, um, to open their eyes and to, to push back on that because it, that dismissiveness is, uh, I mean, these are public lands and resources and everybody has a say. They aren't the oil and gas industry's lands and resources. So really highlighting that. And you know, they dismiss form letters, but the reality is a form letter, you're still choosing to submit it. You're saying to the Bureau, Bureau of Land Management, I agree with this statement, this reflects my sentiment. So don't ever, people should never let, let the Bureau of Land Management tell you that a form letter doesn't count or that it's not good enough. Um, that's always a pet peeve of ours. Thanks again, Ralph. I also wanted to add something. Um, Jeremy said multiple times in the meeting that the people, the least they could have did was show their face. Like, honestly, what we showed up, well, I showed up to five of the meetings, and I'm even wondering if these people even showed up. So two of the meetings were held from 2 to 4 p.m. The other three were held at 9 o'clock in the morning. That was a way to specifically leave out people because they have to make breakfast. They have to get their kids to school. They have to go to work. Everyone's busy right now. And they literally found another way, another loophole to just specifically silence everybody. And then there was some downtime in the meeting. And at the time, you know, we were like, uh, they were playing music instead of answering the questions that the people had for them. And the way the meeting was held was not like this, guys. It was straight up, we're looking at a screen, and that was it the whole time. 
and they didn't even get to see us how we reacted how we felt well I mean you put it into the motion and words but I just cannot believe the whole way the meeting was set up think about that only two of them were at two to four o'clock the other were at nine o'clock in the morning that was specifically done and I want everyone to take advantage of their social media page make sure you share the information make sure you create videos and just uplift this whole awareness you we have to post about it because we could talk all about it but unless we're posting about it it can make a difference my profile picture on facebook it literally shows all the leakage that i got from the sierra club and then my background shows all the fracking rigs that we have in the state of new mexico sixty thousand wells who knows if there's more than that because i don't know but i just have to highlight what Jeremy had said earlier in the meeting. Right, that was Felina, right? Uh, yes, ma'am, sorry about that. Oh, no, that's okay. My, you know, um, the whole point of this, like having the meetings virtually, it's tough. Um, I'm here in a rural area and I can hear everybody. Um, I can't always see the videos or, um, or um, even when you're you're speaking because of the bandwidth of the internet. So I think that we're all um, getting a sense from, from this meeting that there was a lot missing at the BLM hearings. And I have also noticed that giving people a chance to talk for longer than three minutes, you know, we all sometimes, you don't wanna feel rushed um, to say what you have to say and so, that's why we're taking the time right now. Is there anybody else who wanted to uh, add another comment at this time? Uh, you know, um, this is Rebecca Sobel from Wild Earth Guardians. I'll go on the record with my comment now too. Um, I also had, the displeasure of attending all five of BLM's virtual meetings. Um, and I was appalled to say the least. I was one of the people that on more than one occasion used my comment time to play twisted sisters, we're not gonna take it because that's how I feel. Um, we're not gonna take it. It's, you know, this, this area is, is very significant and very important. Um, and the Bureau of Land Management is running roughshod over public lands all across the American West and blocking the public out of public engagement opportunities. And for me now more than ever, the fact that we could even be considering adding 2,100 to 3,400 new industrialized fracking wells off the sacred landscape at a time where it, the oil and gas actually makes more money in the ground than it does coming up. The price per barrel of oil is so cheap right now. And New Mexico, where I live, is now considering being a state that will be a dumping ground for this toxic radioactive oil and gas waste. And our budget in New Mexico was based on the price per barrel of oil being 50 or $55. Um, now we're under 20. It depends on the day. Sometimes it's negative. But we are literally, you know, I like to tell people, people, unfortunately for us, the industrialized fracking industry is still treated like regular old oil and gas. And we're talking about an industry that's very different from the oil and gas that people knew in the turn of the 20th century through the 50s. Um, you know, instead of sucking a straw into a formation of oil and gas and sucking up oil, we are drilling instead of 1,000 feet, 10,000 feet down under the ground and extracting formations. We don't know what the cumulative environmental and public health impacts of such a destructive and industrialized practice is having on our landscape. And I'm, you know, I have to t just say, despite all of that, I feel blessed and privileged to get to be on a people's hearing with all of you and know that we are not alone fighting this. You know, there are a lot of voices that some of those voices that are quoted in some of the videos that were that we've posted that aren't able to attend um, this meeting today they're dealing with life or death situations and 
broadband internet equity issues and it means a lot to me and I know to them that there are dozens of people and 100 people registered plus and people watching on Facebook that are here supporting that call. Uh, you know, what I what I hear from uh, Council Delegate Daniel So all the time is he he talks about how the industrialized fracking in the in the tri chapter community area has created it created a um, environment of haves and have nots those that are that are getting royalty payments from leasing oil and gas on their lands and those that are not and even those that are drilling and on land they have mineral rights to or their land. Those folks are not getting as much money as they were five and six years ago. And so now even the haves in these areas, in these areas are still have nots. Um, you know, I know that if, Dan I don't feel bad speaking for him because I know that if Daniel were here, he would tell a story about um, asking the grandmothers in the tri-chapter area for permission to start the Greater Chaco Coalition. And I love it when he tells that story because they're really, it's been a privilege to do this work with all of you because our coalition is anybody that will be a part of it. And it is anybody that is working to protect the public health, air, water, and environmental justice of this region. And we are very much in concert with not just the folks that are living within 300 feet from oil and gas drill sites, but also those that call this area special and sacred all across not just the state, not just the region, but the world. Um, and so I just want to thank all of you for still being here and continuing to sound the call and raise the alarm and continue to raise some hell um, and hold BLM and BIA's feet to the fire. We have, we will have a lot more work to do. This, this plan, you know, and I'll, I'll just say, in addition to, to being a part of the virtual, the privilege to be a part of, I think all 10, yeah, all 10 of the scoping meetings that happened in 2016 and 2017. So this plan, this plan that was proposed, that, that being proposed right now, and I wanna like show it to you for a second. This plan, this, oh, can you see it with my background? Not so much. Oh, you can't. No, yeah. it's blended into the virtual background. It blends in, but you can sort of get a sense of how thick this plan is. Um, it's a this thick plan, was was announced in uh, 2013 and we've been working on it for that long and in 2016 and 2017 the bureau, bureau of land management and bureau of indian affairs held 10 meetings those were mostly in navajo chapter houses and also in pueblo communities to get input from these communities on what the plan should include and they produced what's called a scoping report. They produced a report based on everybody's comments. And they promised in that report, based on community feedback, that this plan would address environmental justice, that this plan would address night skies, cultural preservations, environmental health. And we see this huge plan. Oh, look, you can see it now. Um, and it doesn't do any of that. It doesn't do any of that. Um, the BLM papers over and pays lip service to any form of cumulative analysis. They don't even analyze the drilling that's happening a few miles over in the adjacent field office. And while they're pretending to take the time to, to analyze these impacts, because let's be clear, they've been sued and they've lost, so they're forced to analyze these impacts, they're still approving more wells. And what gets me the most is that right now, while the state of New Mexico is in emergency shelter in place orders and while Navajo Nation is on lockdown with the highest rates of coronavirus of anywhere in the United States per capita, the Bureau of Land Management is still approving fracking wells in these areas right now. And in fact, even more insulting, not only they are approving it, they're having what's called on-sites, which means the last stage of approval in the drilling process. And they basically call, do a public call out to say, come to the proposed drill site and let us know if you think we should move it over a foot over here or move it over a little bit over here. And so in, if, this, if this well pad was going up in your backyard, which it is happening in Eastern Navajo Na Agency, the Bureau of Land Management right now is inviting members of the public, anybody interested to come to public spaces to illegally gather just to be able to approve new fracking wells. And this 
I, it's heart wrenching and it makes me so mad. And I have also had, I've had the chance to get to work with a lot of Bureau of Land Management officials, people that are actually doing this rubber stamping. And the individuals are not bad people, they're all trying, but the system is broken. The system is so broken. And right now our administration, the Trump administration, is, is, prop, is propping forward a energy dominance policy, which basically equates to the value understanding that our public lands and our public resources are all for sale for private profit and for pennies. And it's up to us whether it's response to equitable relief in Corona times um, or a new future of keep it in the ground. But I believe this is the beginning of demanding a new normal. We can't go back to the way things were because the way things were, were very broken. We must go forward. And that starts with demanding a plan that does what BLM promised it was going to do, which is put people and public health first. And I tell all of you that it will take all of us at every opportunity, at every angle, all directions, pressure, all the time to hold this administration accountable. But we've proven that we can. The fact that the administration delayed this public comment process by 120 days, it's not enough. It's not enough. But it's a victory that it happened because it shows that they listened to public pressure. We just need more of it. And we've gotten the Bureau of Land Management to cancel lease sales in Greater Chaco in the past. And right now they're proposing a plan that is business as usual, more drilling full steam ahead. And it will be up to us to take that next step and to really call for the action that's necessary. And I just wanna thank you all for being here and getting to be in solidarity with you. That's it. Thanks, Rebecca really clear that we need a whole new plan and not just this amendment that leaves everything out and including environmental justice and people's health and well-being and we are still taking more comments so we're still doing the open call format if anyone else has not been heard and is ready to give a comment let me know and i can help unmute you or you can unmute yourself And jump in. I just wanted to add, I hope I was clear when I said that I posted my profile picture and my profile background on Facebook um, about like, you know, fracking. That's a way to literally create awareness. Um, I'm not too sure if I was clear on that, but I just wanted you guys to know that I was saying that so that way I can inspire you or motivate you to place your profile picture or your background just for a few days, if not a few hours, if you even can, um, just so we can literally visually show somebody because people see my background and it's like a, like just words, it's not just like a person. In fact, I haven't just been a person on Facebook for a long time, it's just different awareness that I do. Thanks, Felina. Yeah, it's really important to spread the word. You know, if there are, um, if people want a minute to think about other comments, I can, we've got a bunch of other videos um, that folks have submitted and I, I'll play one or two more to give folks a minute. That sounds good. Yeah, I think, I think that'd be great because I think we're scarred from the periods of dead silence, dead silence. during the BLM meetings. So let's fill it with good, good video fodder. Knowledge is key.
Greater Chaco Region is located in northwestern New Mexico, where more than 94% of public lands are currently leased to oil and gas companies. These companies are responsible for over 40,000 fracking wells within the San Juan Basin. Harmful chemicals and omnipresent vibrational sounds are emitted from these infrastructures 24 hours a day. Toxic chemicals include formaldehyde, acetone, and methane. Winds carry these harmful pollutants through the air into the landscape and surrounding life. These chemicals are often invisible to the human eye. Methane is 87 times stronger than carbon dioxide as a climate pollutant. The methane hotspot sitting over the San Juan Basin is the largest concentration of methane in the United States and larger than the size of the state of Delaware. The BLM, Bureau of Land Management, is responsible for leasing public and tribal lands to the oil and gas companies. To date, they have never completed a study to analyze the impacts of industrial fracking. Fracking wells exist within as little as 300 feet close to schools and homes. Methane and other gas emissions manifest in three main ways. Physical health symptoms include headaches, birth defects, psoriasis, and cancers. Mental health impacts may manifest in the forms of stress, depression, and anxiety. Harmful environmental health symptoms involve obstructed soil, polluted air, distressed plants, disruption to animals, contamination of water, and disturbance to the livelihood of humans. Frack Off Greater Chaco is a collaborative effort between indigenous community leaders, native groups, nonprofit organizations, and public lands and water protectors in the Southwest and across the country working to stop fracking in Greater Chaco. For more information and to learn how you may help the efforts already underway, please visit the Greater Chaco Coalition at frackoffchaco.org. from the artists that did a visit and residency. I'll play one more and um, we'll do a pause to see if anybody else wants to speak and then um, we can end with the most recent video done for Chaco. But um, there, this one, I'll play two more. This one was done by River Heal Healers, which came with a drone to a few sites um, to do some aerial drone footage so that folks not in the area could get a sense of the impact of fracking in the area. And this site that you'll see in this video is actually the site of the 2016 explosion uh, where 36 fracking storage tanks exploded in a fire that burned for five days and forced 55 members to evacuate. sense of what these sites look like and this is a uh, I'll play two more because these are short this is a short clip um, that was done from friends um, at University of New Mexico talking about some of the systemic inequity issues that folks in Eastern Agency on Navajo Nation are dealing with for those of you who don't know we we suffer abject poverty and you know I, I just have to sit, call it like it is oh. You know, our unemployment rate is 50 to 70%, depending on what you say, you know, depending on what statistic you're looking at. 
approximately 40% of the Navajo people do not have running water in their homes. Um, and I, I think 60% don't have a telephone, and then 30% don't, don't have access to electricity. Um, so we need we need to improve the living conditions on the Navajo Nation. And bringing safe, reliable drinking water is going to be one of those ways to do it. For anybody who's a student of Navajo, I'm sure you've heard of the Bennett Freeze area in the far west. I always point out that the socioeconomic statistics on eastern Navajo are worse than on the Bennett Freeze. This is the poorest area of the Navajo Nation. Um, we're in peace and we're in... First up, the Navajo. This one's from San Juan Citizens Alliance. It's pretty inhumane when there's uh, the mentality of money is more important than people. And that's what's going on here. It seems like the National Monument, the Chapel, they're all being taken care of. These people are no longer in existence, but they have the greatest protection. And the people that live out of here, they're not talking about their needs, their quality of life. As a matter of safety, the school was moved to right within the invisible distance of this chapter house. And guess what? Within a city block, there's an oil well pad that has five wells on it. And through this little area, at one time, there were six flares. People are getting sick. Criminal activity has risen, and that's proven. Like, how does that not sink into everyone's head here? There is not even a fire station within this corridor right here. When, when violence happens, where is this nearest substation at? I lost two family members, and it took nearly four hours for anyone to come. When someone is being in my family, where do they go? The fire at my means, and who were the first responders? The fire at the private computer. There was a propane truck that blew up about a mile away. Who were the first responders? People 60 miles away. With that fire or the explosion that happened, there was no evacuation plan. They had that fire. What have they done so far for them? Other than just to kick dirt over the spill and left it there. We talk about water, we can talk about cultural resources, but if you look down on it, if you look really close at it, what about the health impacts? What about the social impacts? We had an explosion down here, and um, one of my relatives stated that he was scared. He's only, he's only fifth grader. If it's safe, if it's safe for people, how come the oil field workers have to wear a hydrogen sulfide meter on their belts when they drive up? If it's safe, why do they have those precautions? Why do they have oxygen masks in their units if it's safe? Thanks, Rebecca, for showing those movies. So we are still going to have an open call for folks who want to do another comment. I'm going to say a quick comment here, um, but there will still be time because we're going to stay here until everybody who wants to speak has had a chance and had a turn. Um, so Maya, did you want to say something? Yeah. Okay, great. Can you, you can see? go ahead. Can you see me? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, hi everyone. Um, 
my name is Mai King Flaherty, and I'm an organizer with the Sierra Club Rio Grande chapter. And um, it's been a really, um, I think, always illuminating kind of public hearing um, to hear the profound things that people have to say about Chaco. Um, and I've been working with the coalition and a few people on these calls for a couple of years now. And um, and I just want to say that the you know the struggle and the fight to protect the greater Chaco region just represents so many issues um, from environmental degradation of our public and ancestral tribal lands from fossil fuels extraction. And the virtual meetings also really underscore like the long-standing history of the federal government failing to meaningfully consult with tribes and honor their trust responsibilities. And um, I think this period also kind of really amplifies how marginalized communities are often systematically disenfranchised from decision-making processes um, that impact their communities, um, like impacts to public health, air and water quality that people um, kind of in this planning area um, have commented on and just overall general well-being that are deteriorated by expanded oil and gas drilling. And you know, the coronavirus, it's a respiratory disease. We've heard and read many articles about the Navajo Nation being hit particularly hard. Um, but communities in the Greater Chaco region um, that are impacted by the BLM and the Bureau of Indian Affairs Management Plan have been subjected to poor air quality um, from existing oil and gas development, you know, causing pre existing conditions like COPD or asthma, diabetes, and heart disease, and making these communities particularly um, um, vulnerable to the effects of what we're seeing. And, um, you know, I think it kind of underscores the need um, for the BLM to conduct a full and offer a full comprehensive health and impact assessment. Um, of the activities that they are permitting in this region, fracking. Um, we know it deteriorates air quality. Um, we know that the chemicals and that we breathe um, lead to many um, health impacts. And I, I just think this, this pandemic has really magnified um, many longstanding injustices that we need to address and fix, um, including you know, the need to address the climate crisis. And I just want to um, thank the organizers um, and participants and the coalition members and everyone for providing really great comments and and um, yeah let's just make the BLM listen. Thanks. Thank you Maya. Is there anyone else out there who would like a chance to make a comment. I can go ahead and say my comment quickly and then I will put out another call though um, right after this. Um, and really I just wanna talk about the um, Food and Water Watch and Food and Water Action and our members and supporters uh, who have for the last few years, um, thousands of members and supporters here in New Mexico and also many that are out of state have signed petitions and have sent letters to the BLM and to the Secretary of the Interior even in the last week um, protesting the fracking development in the greater Chaco region um, and many folks who are allies and um, working in solidarity. And, you know, this public outcry has been going on for years and years. And for, for many folks, we're just um, really people do not want to live like this, where Indigenous voices are silenced and where um, land and communities be have become sacrifice zones. And so there are many, many people who are out there who are opposing this oil and gas development, continued oil and gas development. And it's really, um, we really think there's a call or we need a call to have a whole new plan with an environmental impact statement 
that considers the health and well being of the climate and of our communities and of our state. So that's my quick comment. And we still have time for others. If anyone's out there, I'm going to give us a few seconds here and wait. And if um, you can unmute yourself, um, put your name in the chat. And I guess if, um, if there are not any, and if there's not anyone else who wants to make a comment right now, Rebecca, did you have um, one other thing you wanted to share or was that a closing video? Well, I just thought, I apologize folks. I've got two computers that I'm trying to play with. So that's why you get my echo. Um, I did see the odds had just come online and I saw Penelope maybe wanting to comment. I don't want to put people at the spot, but uh, we could do a, a closeout after if, every, if everyone decides that there's nothing more left to say. We'll uh, do a little closeout and end it with a video, but let's give it a minute. Hi, this is Beata. I'd like to speak a little bit on the perspective. Well, Beata, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I can hear Beata. Oh, no, never mind. Just me. <laughs> okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for staying on. Thanks for those who joined. Uh, my name is Beata Sosi. I work with Table Women United's Environmental Health and Justice Program. And I wanted to just comment uh, formally a little bit on what it means to protect those most vulnerable and the intersections of environmental and reproductive justice. Um, when it comes to human health impacts. And, you know, this goes into a lot of, you know, it's a lot of what's already been said around the intersections of um, health of the land and health of the people. And I just want to make clear that even though we advocate for the strictest environmental protections possible for culturally relevant public process and not these shams of um, a public process that we've been witness to this last week. Um, that even though we can advocate for these protections, for these justice, for just the basic right to have a voice um, for these things that impact us as communities does not mean that we condone this what I see as state sanctioned violence on indigenous peoples and lands. Um, so just to clarify that even though we're, we give our input and advocate, there's a lot that we don't agree with or condone when it comes to um, the continued occupation of indigenous lands, the continued militarization um, and sacrifice of the Southwest for energy and the military. Um, I'm also, as part of, you know, not kind of separate from my role at TW, I'm also a community doula. And it's really concerning the, the impacts on future generations, the, the way that indigenous peoples exist as land-based, you know, that means that we still gather food from natural sources, we still gather clays, we have dry land farming and we harvest rainwater. Um, we live in close proximity to these fracking sites. And it's really heartbreaking to know what's going on with our Diné relatives and um, the pollution that they're having to endure on a daily basis. You know, and um, I just want to give thanks and recognize the Diné relatives for 
helping to take care of these places that we, even though we no longer live adjacent to them or live there, you know, we, we, it's mutual that we recognize they're ancestrally alive. They're not um, something from the past. They're not something from history. They exist in the present day, um, very much alive and well in our physical, spiritual, cultural way of knowing as people of this place. And it's really encouraging to see the indigenous solidarity amongst um, Pueblos and tribal nations, even Henisaro communities and Chicano, Chicana, Chicanx communities around recognizing the territories of indigenous people as extending beyond these false political boundaries of um, reservations and allotments and things like that. You know, it's these ancestral sites that are maps for our existence, continued existence in this place. And we know that that's not honored or recognized by the US government. And so going back to protecting those most vulnerable, you know, to us, that is our indigenous pregnant families, that is our elders, our children, future generations. And how our land-based existence does not come into consideration when thinking about harm to um, our unborn, to our reproductive capacity. Not taking into account the legacy trauma of living with this environmental violence and degradation that has impacted generational health over centuries. You know, I think this COVID and the communities that we see hit hard, it's part of a pre-existing condition of living in colonial violence. And um, that has already set up people for increased impact and harm. There's a lot of work that's been done by other groups. Um, you know, the Women's Earth Alliance, Native Youth Sexual Health Network, who released that report, um, Violence on Our Land, Violence on Our Bodies. Um, and, you know, they describe prior and informed consent as an internationally accepted principle that recognizes indigenous peoples inherent and prior rights to their lands and resources and respects their legitimate authority to require that third parties enter into an equal and respectful relationship with them based on the principle of informed consent. Free meaning consent is freely given without intimidation, coercion, etc. Prior that consent is given prior to a project, procedure, action, etc informed that information about the project procedure action including options slash alternatives are shared in a way that is culturally safe consent consensual ongoing agreement about a project procedure or action on the land or your body the same report describes how the international indian treaty council has helped to divine environmental violence as the disproportionate and often devastating impacts that the conscious and deliberate proliferation of environmental toxins and industrial development, including extraction, production, export, and release, have on indigenous women, children, and future generations without regard from states or corporations for their severe and ongoing harm. And that's taken from that report, Violence on the Land, Violence on Our Bodies, Building an Indigenous Response to Environmental Violence from the Women's Earth Alliance and Native Youth Sexual Health Network um, released in 2016. It is environmental violence that does not allow for the BLM to take into serious consideration our unique worldview and only prioritize the viewpoint of those enacting the violence and harm. This racism, of course, is unjust and we need everyone's help to end this exploitation of our shared lands at the cost of our environment and health of native peoples and our living waters. Um, we all come from water as our first environment. And as you know, as indigenous pregnant people, that's all people come from water. And what we do to our water, we're doing to ourselves. Um, so think about that when the way water is used in this process. 
there's no separation um, from these impacts. Our spiritual indigenous worldview can no longer be considered outside the scope of industry if the human race is to survive the urgency that is now, that is climate change, that is environmental reproductive justice, you know, the right to, that also encompasses the right to parent and raise our families in a clean, self, clean healthy, and safe environment. Um, and, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of grief going on right now about how indigenous and people of color communities, whether it's from state violence or from environmental violence, how our people continue to be um, genocided as a result of this inconsideration and, and blatant racism. It's, yeah, it's, it's really terrible how people existing adjacent to these fracking sites have been disproportionately impacted for generations. Um, that I don't think we realize since even before horizontal drilling got developed, you know, since before that land got checkerboarded. Um, so thinking about that, our quality of life has been under constant attack since our land was seized under a set of values that separated peoples from their land. And that's a quote from Las Mujeres Avlan. Uh, community summary in a CDC report, the La Hadra 2012. And um, so I just wanted to call attention to these intersections of um, what it means that in one pregnancy, three generations can be impacted to environmental exposure and pollution. Um, because you know, my daughters were born with all of their reproductive capacity. Um, and indeed that was forming while they were inside of me. So any exposures that I experienced um, would be passed on to them. And so that's three generations held in one pregnancy. And that isn't, all, that isn't considered in the scope of these environmental impacts, you know, not to mention that human health was practically completely omitted. Um, we're constantly having to advocate for health studies and health impacts, the burden of proof falls on our communities to prove the harm that we see is happening on a daily basis. And that's not right. Um, and you know, if we wanna even take it further to that forced removal of land as our resource and healthy lands as our resource, then that's also how our children are born into this world. To, being, to be born with fracking operations going on adjacent to them, to not be able to um, have that culture of peace to come into other than the, prote the immediate protection of their parenting families. Um, is something that has to change for the survival of everyone on this planet where indigenous families are centered in all of our policies and decisions. And if they're centered, everybody's protected automatically. You know, and so like, how can we really start to look as a collective um, through our resistance to center indigenous pregnant people, to center indigenous pregnant women, um, to center families living adjacent to these sites. And when you think about the word indigenous, it's not just the people of this place, it's the land, it, it's the plants, it's the animals of this place, it's the waters of this place. And so by centering indigenous communities, um, we have to do that as the foundation, you know, for like, we can get caught up in being in our heads and the technical analysis. And I'm grateful for those who are taking that piece on, um, you know, the technical aspects of this issue and this RMP, that's really important. But um, just wanna, you know, reiterate that that does not condone the bigger picture of the systemic issues and systemic violence that we're facing as indigenous peoples and as our ability to continue our memory to continue our passing on the knowledge we have of place and our relations with all of these 
um, indigenous beings that I talked about. Um, yeah, people have mentioned the fracking tour, you know, it was really, uh, it was really hard to see cornfields in between fracking pads, to see all the plants that I gather seasonally as medicine for my family next to a fracking pad and drilling site. Um, so I want to honor, you know, bring in those plant relatives, bring in those and set ancestors of our seeds um, that also contribute to health and wellness for our people, that we need to be able to have our food and seed sovereignty in a healthy, clean, safe environment for, um, for us to, to thrive, you know, and in the very least, yeah, I just wanted to bring them into this conversation, um, to bring water into this conversation as living beings and remember who it is that is not present, um, you know, and in these times, it's a lot of us. In this format, it's a lot of us that aren't present. So um, just wanted to touch on that a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, huge thanks. Beata. Thanks, Beata. Yeah, there's so, so much to this issue that to unpack that is so far beyond just the bureaucracy of what's being thrown at us right now and so much in our minds and in our hearts that are really hard to articulate and we haven't been given space to, um, to unpack that. And um, we, are, we still have an open call for anybody who wants to speak right now. Um, and I think there are a few other, other comments, um, yeah, I think somebody uh, from folks and to Wendy, uh, Wendy at city. Mm -hmm. She's just finishing up. She's just finishing another. up. Okay. And did Susan Selvin want to speak? So I don't know, um, I didn't see that in the chat, but if, if anybody um, does want to speak and you're not able to, because I don't hear anybody talking right now, um, I can unmute you if anyone's having trouble. Margaret, it looks like from the chat that Susan Sherman wanted to speak. Oh, okay. I, did, I actually can't see that. So. Um, <laughs> no, I already spoke. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. I thought it was that. Okay. Sorry. Okay. No, I saw another, I saw a different Susan, um, Susan Selbin. And sorry, I don't want to call anybody out um, if you don't want to make a comment, but I just want to keep it open. Why don't I do, I've got a whole, Wendy. oh, go ahead. Oh no, I saw Wendy joined our call. I thought I just heard some birds tweeting their comment. <laughs> that was probably my birds. I got wrens that are going nuts outside and toeys. So I know that Wendy is on a one more phone call um, and waiting to get on and we're also, oh, Anson uh, was also collect, uh, signed up to give public comment. So we'll wait for him to come on. In the meantime, I will play one more short video um, that was also submitted. This one is from EcoFlight, who's a partner for us that um, helps do aerial, um, takes people in airplanes to do aerial images of the area. My name 
is Councilman Mark Martinez um, with the Pueblo of Zuni, representing the Zuni tribe. My name is Mark Mitchell, um, former governor for the Pueblo of Tezuki. My name is Joshua Mandalina, I'm the governor for the Pueblo of Jemez. My name is Travis Vigil, I'm with the Pueblo of Tezuki. My name is Keegan King, and I'm with the Partnership for Responsible Business. My name is Paul Reed, I am a preservation archaeologist with Archaeology Southwest. We did a flyover to uh, Chaco and the surrounding areas, which is not only a historic site, but it also has cultural ties to many of the current day Pueblos. Today I went up on three of the overflights in the Chaco area and I was trying to give folks a sense of the archaeology, specifically along the North Road from point where Twin Angels Pueblo is, on the edge of Coots Canyon, and then the approximately 35 miles down the North Road going south into Chaco. So we flew over Twin Angels, Pierre's, got a good look at that ended up at Pueblo Alto down on the edge of Chaco Canyon where the North Road hits the canyon. Alto was a pretty amazing site just because of all the roads intersecting there. Then our terminal point in the south was the site of Pueblo Benito, which really is the grandest site in the Chaco world and really one of the gems of American archaeology and really world archaeology. As you get closer to Farmington, you see many more of the effects of oil and gas development. Instead of just protecting this one little site, the, the idea is to try to protect around it. But as you can see by the proximity of these spider webs in the exploratory phase, that's just not going to happen the way things are going. The essence of the issue is that BLM treats individual archaeological sites or sacred sites that tribes might identify and says, okay, we're going to put a little protection zone around this site and then we protected it, and then they allow oil and gas development perhaps all the way around those resources. So, you know, Pueblo Benito is, is protected. It's a World Heritage Site in Chaco Canyon, but only five miles north of there. Several of these leases have been let out, and we could see the dramatic development that close to Pueblo Benito. And Juan Chaco is really noted for its night skies. We took a flight last night and saw some of the flaring and the lights on top of these rigs, and it's a big denigration of the quality of the night sky, which is one of the real features of the park itself. You know, it is federal law that agencies consult with tribes that are affiliated to some of these areas. No one has come to my office and talked about the management plan and uh, future uh, developments of these areas. So that is a huge concern for me. We would hate to see uh, uh, cultural and historic treasure like Chaco Canyon be um, impacted in any way by new drilling operations. It really does have a concern to the peace and tranquility of the landscape. And uh, that is truly what we do not want to forget and we want to pass it on from generation to generation. We need to sit down with Bill and, and find out exactly what they're doing and what they want to do. This is the main point that we need to make with the public and with the BLM is to slow down this development and push it further away from the sites that really matter to all of us. All right, we've got that one and one more from the UNM uh, or the land trust project with those artists. Although, wait, I think we saw this one. Maybe. There are many who call this home and have been in relation here for hundreds, thousands, and years more than can be known. Indigenous peoples, Diné and Pueblo, who have cared for the land, waters, and one another, acknowledging and protecting the sacredness of place life, ancestors, and future generations. The land, mesas, canyons, springs, cornfields, sheep ranges, grasses, trees, medicine plants, animals. Sorry y'all, I was just reminded that we did see the video. So I apologize. I've got a lot we're putting on. Um, we have one that we're gonna end with that I'll wait for. Um, but let's see, is Wendy on the call and ready yet? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Sorry I clicked in late, <laughs> but glad to see you all. Oh, am, am I in a, am I, is my 
It's sideways. I don't know. Okay, so I have to go. Yeah, it looks like there you go. (laughs) Yeah, it's been a hot day. Okay. (laughs) Well, thank you all for having the time and um, putting up the people's hearing is very important. I think um, if you were looking on the BLM Facebook on some of that virtual meetings, you could kind of see that uh, comment I made did not quite go through. And um, it was technical difficulties. And that was one of the big issues with um, not having um, that consideration for the communities that it really is tough to make that um, way of connecting with, uh, you know, with a, a decent service to carry you on um, for hours and even to actually try to put video to it and um, because I live around Farmington and um, I'm a member of um, the chapter her for no and I, I vote there and so um, I actually work with an organization called the net care and I'm their New Mexico energy organizer so um, I wanted to share with you today before um, the beautiful sun goes down um, a nice uh, poem that I kind of came up with and thought maybe you would be okay to to have a chance to hear it. So let me start here. It was over 30 years ago that I sat on a school bus heading to the National Historic Chaco Park. The rattling of the faded bus, light dust answering the crack of the windows, our young voices chattering in the background as a lunch meat sticking to the white bread. The museum was ready to have us watch a video describing the intercontinental trading highway that indigenous tribes traveled to Chaco from the Southern Hemisphere. The celestial connection the sun and the moon carries to lay out of the adobe earthen bricks among the winter and summer solstice marked by the ceremonial positioning of the rocks. As a petroglyph shared the story of a supernova sketched over hundreds of years ago. A connection was felt before stepping into the museum as my family shared stories growing up to respect the sacred space that held our people from time immemorial. For hundreds of years, prayers and songs filled the canyons. Nourishment was planted in the seeds for the loved ones as they worked on a beautiful pottery painted with earth elements. Now, 30 years later, I drive into four corners with over 36,000 oil and gas wells sprinkled in San Juan County. We hold distinct honors, the highest level of ozone with national recognition of a methane hotspot. I sit now with my asthma inhaler, a recycled water bottle, and a cell phone charger. My car competes on a highway with the fracking semi-trucks, hauling sand, produced water, or natural gas. At night, the flares become the constellational roadmap of the landscape as the invisible gas releases into the air, dancing with nitrogen oxide to release ozone. The vitality of organic compounds enters our respiratory system ends as we drink polluted fracked water. 30 years from now, I hope to see healing that begins with our community voices and hearts, sharing to the oil and gas to stop, to hear the healthy laughter and stories of our people filled in the space of our lungs, then the silent remoteness of the beauty of Chaco, honoring this sacred space above, below, and within. Thank you. Well, that's all I have. Thanks, Wendy. That was great. Thank you so much, Wendy. I did, um, there are some folks that weren't able to join Zoom but are watching on Facebook and Samuel Sage is one of them. Um, And he had submitted some old testimonies. So I'm gonna take a moment and share a couple of Samuel Sage's words, who is the counselor chapter coordinator. Um, Let's do this. Good evening. My name is Samuel Sage. I live here in Farmington. I am here, I went to Navajo Methodist Mission High School, 1970. Before that, when a lot of that was farmland, I worked on there. And over the years, a lot has changed. 
continue to leave here, leave here a little bit, come back. When I first came back, when I would take walks behind the hills, I saw one well, maybe a couple of tanks, hardly in the roads, it was undisturbed. It was nice. You could actually walk upon some wild turkeys, deer, antelope. Today, there are about 17 wells right behind where I live. There are pipelines all over. Noise. There's trash dumped. Roads all over. Depending on what time of the day you walk out there, you constantly hear gunshots. So you either have to wear fluorescent or else just go on top of the hill and turn around. That's how much it has changed. Well, my community is actually a counselor's. All of you talk about the economics, the beautiful public lands, out here, how you're able to walk, breathe in the clean air, clean sky. I guess I can only say is that uh, I think that might be in, uh, only for the white people. Over the counselors, the impacts have been brought to BIA, I mean BIA and BLM, numerous times, roads. The new wells are not well put together. If they were well constructed, you wouldn't have no odors. Our community members complain about headaches, increase in asthma, Last spring, we had our first deformed animal. A lot of the well sites are not fenced in. So there are cattle to go into and drink that. I don't know what the biggest rush is from the well and they load up, get back over there. There is no such thing as safety. Elderly, community people being chased off the road. During snow and mud, oil trucks, water trucks, parked right in the middle of the road, hold up everybody else, hold their chain up. I have been asked, can we move it for them? I said, we have been labeled as a lawless community. It will be up to you. Then later I thought about it, I said, no. Try to help them. Maybe you can help them move it. Our roads are all dirt. They have been torn up. Guess who takes care of it? The county. Economically, revenue, the chapters gets zero dollars. The state gets it. The federal gets it. A few people do get money, yes. But None of the development has begun on the allotment lands. I am also an allotment landowner. So, and then on the leasing, if there's any chance to, any way to enhance the stipulation, we are requesting that the companies that work out there that they have an emergency response plan written and turned over to the chapter houses. A good example is that tank explosion by Nyeezy. Nobody knows what's going on. Okay. Then one last thing, BLM. I don't know how much you have control over the companies. WPX employees went to some of my community members and told them, if you make any noise, you talk against fracking, you're going to have to pay your bonuses back. So 
I don't know what kind of nonsense that is. You have no right to tell my people that. So, then one other thing. We went to Washington last summer to encourage BLM to pass the methane rule. And Derek told them all the time that we have been at odds with BLM, but this is the one thing that we are celebrating and encouraging BLM is to implement the methane rule. One last thing. You were over in my chapter house, November 12th. Your consultants agreed to pay you the rent, $78.75. I'm here to collect. I know you don't consult, and I guess you don't pay you the rent. That was Samuel Sage at a meeting in Farmington um, that the BLM was holding. And I've got one more piece of testimony that was submitted. This is from um, Melanie Yazi of the Red Nation at a protest against using fracking waste uh, or dumping fracking waste into rivers and streams and onto crops. Got it? So you can introduce yourself sure. and what you're doing here. Sure. So my name is Melanie Yazi. Yeah, to all of my Diné relatives who are watching or reading this. Um, I'm the elected chair for the Central Governing Council for the Red Nation. We're the organization that sponsored and organized this action today. We've issued nine demands to elected officials, um, to industry executives, as well as to our tribal leaders, and issuing a call out, a call for mobilization to our own people, to rise up and demand a complete moratorium on all new leases for fracking, and really to end resource extraction. We understand resource extraction as a form of ongoing colonialism and land dispossession. Um, it's a complete infraction on tribal sovereignty, and as indigenous people, the Red Nation is an indigenous Led organization. This is why we're here today. We're here to demand consultation on respect for tribal sovereignty. And we're really here ultimately to demand an end to resource extraction, which from its inception about a hundred years ago in our communities has been ravaging our land and our waters and our relatives. And in order for us to have any kind of future, we follow in the footsteps of the folks who rose up in Oak Flat in 2015, our relatives who rose up in Standing Rock in 2016. We extend solidarity um, and kinship to our relatives are rising up in Bayou Bridge against pipelines right now. We're all part of this larger struggle against climate change, which has been caused by resource extraction, oil and gas development and usage. Where they met Brunner is a racist piece of shit! Let's go into the sidewalk. All right, guys, we gotta let them know. Again, I said this earlier, but these guys are having these meetings without tribal consultation. So we're gonna bring the consultation to them ourselves. We're letting them know that we won't drink your fracking water. We won't drink your fracking water.
That's right. So this is why we're here today and we're not going to stop until we achieve the demands, all nine of the demands that we're here to issue today. Thanks to Red Nation for remembrance of that and also sort of the legacy of fracking that it's not it's not just these well sites that are in the greater Chaco area or in Southeast New Mexico, but it's also the legacy of waste and water and air pollution um, that's wrapped up with these sites. Pass it over to Margaret. Hey there, well, we're gonna do another call out for comments. If anybody is ready to give a comment or hasn't had a chance to. Um, I think Anson Wright just joined the call a bit ago. And I, if you wanted to give a comment. Oh, it looks like he just, uh, feel he just left. Oh, really? Okay. You know, okay. I think my internet's not keeping up with this. No worries. Uh, thank you close. for letting me know. Might be close to wrap But anybody up. else? Um, okay. Yeah, because I know that this is, this, uh, I mean, it's so great. Thank you, everybody, for, you know, sticking around and staying on. I know we got a good group here. Um, Rebecca, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, thank you, Felina, for your comment. I miss protest. Yes, so do we. This is no substitute for protest. So we can't wait to take it to the streets again at some point, hopefully. I I was still joining them and yelling over here, so it's good. <laughs> have to let that in. Oh, have to let the energy release. <laughs> yeah, it's good to be re-inspired. Well, if there's no more comment. We'll um, play one. We do have lots of other videos, and we'll post those. Um, in the Facebook so that folks can watch them and make sure they're still submitted as part of the record. Um, but there's one last video that we play on this hearing. This is a collaborative uh, effort between um, Spoken Image Productions and Pueblo Action Alliance and Kendra Pinto. And there will be a full length feature documentary coming out um, on fracking in the greater Chaco area. And the director pulled together this eight minute um, teaser or sort of preview of that video that um, shows a lot of folks in the Greater Chaco Coalition um, and summarizes the issues and also gives a ends us out on a nice call. So we'll play this video and then um, Jeremy you can close us out unless there's anybody else that wants to to give comment before. And in the meantime, here we go. More than 93% of the available lands in the Greater Chaco region have already been leased out for oil and gas extraction. We are fighting for the last 7%. The Greater Chaco region is the ancestral homelands of the Pueblo and Diné indigenous peoples of the Southwest. The Chaco Culture National Historical Park is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and the home of ancestral Pueblo Kivas and dwellings. Pueblo people maintain a living and spiritual connection to the landscape and the Navajo communities live within the region. Despite rising opposition from sovereign tribal nations and environmental groups, and even in the face of a global health crisis, the Bureau of Land Management continues to approve fracking operations in the region and are now moving forward with the approval of thousands of new fracking wells within the greater Chaco landscape. Indigenous peoples particularly are being hit the hardest by the coronavirus pandemic. In the midst of this public health crisis, the Bureau of Land Management is still continuing to sell off federally managed land parcels for extraction, and they are also refusing to extend its public comment period for a major new drilling plan in the Greater Chaco region. Frontline communities face threats to their health and well-being, while the United States' historic failure to respect tribal sovereignty is an everyday reality. Since 2014, the Greater Chaco Coalition has been leading efforts to educate their communities and share the impacts of oil and gas activities. The Fracking is a Fracking Reality Tour is a glimpse of the oil drilling that's happening in the counselor community. It was started by Daniel So, and he's given this tour for a few years now. 
and it's meant to show you firsthand the cumulative impacts of fracking. There's all sorts of people that come on this tour. There's people wanting to lend their support, but they don't know how. And so when you show them the, show them the firsthand impacts, it makes a difference on how they respond to the issue. I have a six-year-old grandson. I want him to be able to breathe clean air, drink clean water. I want him to know that it came times to where we spoke up, and I want him to know that I did speak up and fought on his behalf. Yeah, there is a lot more work to do. It will continue for however long until it, we completely stop and um, do fossil fuel extraction to where we can actually say that we no longer rely on it. We have different forms, things that we need to do and use. So. It's good to be here at Washbashaka. Thank you to the leadership from Washington, D.C. for being with us and to listening to our concerns. But for today, really the biggest and greatest opportunity today is to be here, to have my footprints where my ancestors laid theirs and where we continue to visit. We will continue to visit Chaco. We will continue to rely on all that is available to us as Acoma people and Pueblo people. All that is provided within this vast landscape of Chaco remains vital to our continuance as Pueblo people. And I am grateful to the tribal leadership who are here today. And we will continue to work together on not only this issue, but similar issues that we, we are confronted with. And I want the leadership at Washington to understand as these conversations continue, and as we voice the same concerns and find ourselves compelled to share more about why these spaces and places are safe and why it is important for us to continue to speak and to be at the table is because there is so much at stake. We are still uncertain about issues related to quality of water, air, the encroachment on our ancestral landscapes and the direct infringement upon our ability to carry out our inherent responsibility of maintaining culture and our own life way. Thank you for this opportunity again. I'm so pleased that I feel like this fight to keep fracking out of Chaco Canyon has brought the Pueblos together. It's brought the Pueblos and the Navajo Nation together. All the communities who share this beautiful land of New Mexico, they've all uh, come together to work toward protecting this area. We're gonna collaborate and we're going to make sure that we're working hard to protect this beautiful landscape, this living landscape. Being here, <laughs> it, it definitely summons a lot of emotions. I definitely don't like to call them ruins because even though like there may not be people physically living here, like inside these rooms, there's still spirits and ancestors here occupying this space. And this is also a place where a lot of people today, indigenous people, Pueblo people, 
um, still find like their ways back here somewhere or another. You can't call this place like abandoned or an ancient place where it's still very much alive. And then just not to mention that there are actual people, the Dene people living like outside of this area. One wonderful thing for indigenous people that has come out of this Chaco coalition is the Diné and Pueblo solidarity. It's interesting because at one point in our histories, there was definite tension and even this adversarial tension between Pueblo and Diné people. And in this moment in time that old historic beef so to speak has totally been squashed these struggles are a matter of life and death it is our cultures it is our families it is literally our survival that is at stake So I'll hand it over to um, Jeremy to close this out unless anybody else wanted to say anything. I will um, throw this slide on, on screen to remind everyone that um, the comment period has been extended until September 25th. So anybody that's watching this that still wants to submit a written comment, um, you can do so by going directly to the frackoffchaco.org page. We have a, an action network link on our homepage. So if you go to frackoffchaco.org, you will have a portal to submit a comment. And Rebecca, it looks like um, uh, Beverly Singer wants to uh, provide some comment. Uh, she just chatted and Beverly, can you unmute yourself or um, do you need us to unmute you? Can I, hello everyone. Hi. Hello, we can hear you. Good. So, um, so, uh, so I was sitting here, I've listened for about an hour. I got on a little later, but I, I finally said, okay, I guess I need to say, say what's in my heart. And, uh, I've been a part of an ongoing history of understanding the continued cycle of violence and disease thinking that was brought from from Europe <laughs> many hundreds years ago and uh, it continues into the present day. It's, uh, it's a cycle that is really rooted in some very 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 um, deep and and ruptured ways of being in the world, the separation between spirit and life and land. And I, you know, I find uh, as, as over the years that I've, I've been watching the numerous uh, waves of generational violence that's taken place in Native America uh, and in, among indigenous people and have traveled throughout many lands uh, into Africa, into Latin America. Um, and uh, have just have witnessed and been present, you know, where the aftermath of, of so much um, uh, destruction has taken place. And I think about the fact that the people are still here. You know, we indigenous people aren't going anywhere. This is our homeland where we have, where we were born. And the thing about fossil fuels, you know, the fact that it's like the buried remains of all the million, millennia, millions of years of plant and animal, you know, um, carbon that's just been, you know, building and building and building. So we leave our, you know, our, our, our tracks here on this earth as we walk it and then we go on. But in my heart, I know that this struggle, particularly around you know, the whole Chaco uh, area of the basin there, 
And because I, I worked within anthropology for many years and worked with many archaeologists, um, you know, my sense is that there was always this, this uh, disconnect between understanding the significance of what an ancestral site is and the fact that there's always compromise when you're talking about the greed and the uh, corruption and the power and the oppression that is used, you know, in order to get access. I mean, even, you know, even well-minded people, um, good-hearted people, you know, find themselves in a struggle to understand Native people's perspective. But what really defines this particular situation now is that, you know, they're just going to leave all that piping in the ground when they leave, when all the fuel is gone. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sort of interested to see what the state of New Mexico is going to do with its budget, since all of their funding has now been completely devastated by the pandemic. <laughs> and I smile at this because now it's like, oh, we don't have the money coming in from that. You know, it really is all about money and paying salaries and paying, you know, people's profit margins and you know part of this is that you know my my relatives uh, out uh, out there by farmington out by um by counselor my cousin daniel so you know when i hear him speak you know it's like they are faced with such daily disregard and disrespect you know and the anti-indian hatred that has been experienced across this country that's just been unleashed through this particular federal administration is profound. And so I really find that in my heart, I know that our ancestors, you know, they, they left us what they could in terms of their knowledge and their ways of being. And I'm so excited to see and very, very moved to see the, the younger generations just step forward and carry on, you know, this, this, uh, these sites of struggle. That's what they are, sites of struggle. And they'll always be there as long as people continue to have that disease thinking about they need to have more money, more power, more control, you know, and, and devastate anything in its path. But I do know that the strength of all Indigenous people, you know, it, it is within us. And so it's in having us participate in these dialogues and in this, you know, attempt to, to get, you know, the powers that be of the great BLM or the Forest Service or, you know, uh, the Office of, of Budget and Management <laughs> and on a Department of Interior, you know, it just, you know, it, it's an endless stream of bureaucracy which they created in order to prevent, you know, uh, equal access to comment, equal access to power, and they'll never share it. So part of what has to happen are these forums. And so I thank everyone who has contributed their thoughts, their hearts, their energies to these struggles, because they will continue and we will prevail and Indigenous people will prevail. I, I know that. I totally believe that in my heart. Um, but for those without any moral compass, you know, I... I throw them out to the universe <laughs> and they're going to scatter, you know, when all the money and good times are gone. But um, that's my thought. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beverly. That was so great. Um, so appreciate uh, you sharing your thoughts. Um, <sighs> boy. Um, We have quite a challenge ahead of us, but um, you know the fact that we all come together and we're all seeing what's going on and we're speaking truth to power gives uh, gives me so much hope and uh, hope it gives everybody else so much hope. Um, whew. I'm just gonna take a break real quick and also ask: Does anybody else want to say any? Parting words. So I think we're we're we've got uh, kind of the same group that's been involved, and um, just want to make sure everybody has a chance to say what they want to say.
Well, um, with that, Rebecca, um, do we want to, there you are. I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to be the last voice that closes us out because we've had so much wisdom here, but I would be remiss if I didn't once more just thank everyone from the bottom of my heart and um, just express the profound appreciation and gratitude for everyone's voices um, and the wisdom that was shared and the experience that was shared and the fight that you all maintain um, and continue to hold as we move forward on all of this and try to make the world a, a little bit better. You know, it's like, it's like the little bit for me, it's the phoenix out of the ashes that in so much systemic inequity and disaster and travesty, we can at least find each other um, and create group and a movement and some camaraderie. And I'm just very grateful for everyone to not make a chaotic people's hearing. We actually managed to to do this um, with some relative ease. So <laughs> yes, thanks to, to the MCs, thanks to Beata and to Margaret and to Jeremy and to Maya and to everybody <laughs> who commented and contributed. Um, yes, big love. And anybody else that wants to say anything and bring us out, please do. Um, I'm sure this won't be the last time we all see each other. Um, and together making a better world together gives me hope. Thank you. Yes, lots of sparkle hands. Well, everyone. If uh, uh, I guess you know, um, <laughs> yes, this is amazing. So I just want to say thank you. I want to echo that. I don't want to say anything more. Um, should we call it a wrap? Except CBLM, you could do better. You could do better. I said that many times during the virtual hearings that they could do better. Show your faces. Come on. Mm -hmm. Chicken. Yes. Yes. Cowards. But we're showing them. We're showing them that the, you know we're here and we care. So. Um. Well, if uh, this may be the end of the people's hearing. This round. This round. So thank you to everybody for participating. And um, listen to us, BLM, listen to the people. Exactly, exactly. Well, um, thank you. I guess I, we'll call that a wrap. We, we didn't exactly write out like how are we going to end this thing. We're just like, well, it'll run out of gas at some point. What about like a little rant or something, like a little chat where we all say something? Um, like, um, you can't drink oil, then you guys say leave it in the soil or, you know, something like we're not going to take it anymore. We could, or, do that. <laughs> we, could uh, we could wrap it up with... Um, uh, Equal united will never be divided. I like it. Yeah, I like that one. Do you want to lead us, Felina, and we can invite everyone on the call who wants you to go off mute and we can chime back in? Sure, sure. Um, wait, wait. Um, <laughs> the people <laughs> united can never be divided? All right. So it goes, the people united can never be divided. 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 Can't hear y'all. Come on. The people united can never be divided. It's hard to stay in unison with internet. I know. Green New Deal. <laughs> all right everyone so we're going to close this people's hearing thank you so much enjoy your evening and stay tuned for more i love all y'all thank you guys so much bye thanks thank everybody you. Bye. thank you everyone <laughs>